Wicked. Let's get into it. So pleasantries. We're here with yes. Florian Gadsby, who most people probably know. Certainly, if you're in the pottery world. Yeah. But if you don't, you do you class yourself as a potter or a ceramicist, interchangeable. Um, at this point in my life, I don't care. <laughs> um, I'm sure you got. It's contested. Lots. There's lots of arguments about what's the right term, but potter, ceramicist, artist, yeah. writer. Now YouTuber. I don't. Whatever. I'm, Content you know, creator. I'm, yeah. I. I just whatever. I think different situations call for maybe a different term. Mm. And. Um, you're just unapologetically Florian Gadsby. I think it's just easier like that. Otherwise, you know, I, I, the whole Potter versus ceramicist thing is not an argument I want to get into. I understand it from both perspectives. Mm. And I've seen too many old man moments of people having real issues with the different terms. So I'm just happy to live without. Mm. That's fair. You can call me whatever you want. You know, any, 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 any term. Whatever. I'll just call you Florian. That works. There you go. <laughs> there you are. So, question one. Who is Florian Gadsby? Well, uh, long answer or short answer? I mean... Um, Whatever best communicates who you are, which I'm going to I, guess is the long answer. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess nowadays I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a potter, but I'm also many other things, which I never really expected to be. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm a potter full time, but I also um, I make... YouTube videos now once a week, which has sort of become a second job. I mean, social media has always been a second job, mm. but nowadays YouTube is a huge, you know, process. Um, yeah. And but I try to keep pots the focus of my life. That's what I want to be known as. Right. Um, um, but then I now I've also written a book, so now I've maybe an author. I don't know. Again, back to the ceramicist potter thing. I don't really. I'm an artist, I guess. Is the yeah. catches everything but um no i mean i've been making pots since i was more or less 15 years old nice. um i've never had a job other than pottery and i took kind of a very traditional route into the craft i, I went to a school that was um very strict it was you know 45 weeks a year nine till five um they, the, uh, the Irish government paid us to do, like, attend the course. We got a stipend, oh, wow. which is crazy. You know, covered my rent in Ireland, which was only 200 euros a month in a tiny village. And then I did apprenticeships after that in the UK and Japan. And then I moved back to the UK and set my studio up. So I've only ever made pots. It's kind of all I know what to do. But then as time has passed, I, I guess I, I started posting on social media right when craft and Instagram joined forces and made this you know it, it craft went pottery and everything went mad mm. um and i guess yeah i rode that wave and i posted lots and, and and now i that's my second job so half potter half pottery influencer yeah <laughs> <laughs> maybe do you view it as half and half i think maybe now yeah mm. um i mean it's definitely a second job it definitely provides me with half my income right um it's something that's, I have a really strange relationship with it because I, I love social media and I hate it. Um, I don't post anything personal. I try to, you know, I, I want it to be a, a professional platform. Mm -hmm. And it's, I, but you know, doom scrolling is so easy just to get completely obsessed and, 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 and spend all day just on it. So it's, I try when I'm in here, I, I come in and I'll put my phone on a shelf and I won't look at it until lunchtime. Um, but then when it's your business, uh, you have to break that rule. So inevitably, it's a horrible juggle of, of trying to make it work and not being too obsessed. And yeah. It's a hard balance. That it's a hard so balance. hard. Yeah, it's it is a hard balance. hard balance. Because, you know, you have to always be on your phone because you're doing things that you want to share. But the same it's your time, primary business platform. You, get, you exactly. do get distracted. Mm. And, yeah. mm. I know I've often thought about do, do I just get a desk phone? Do I just get something that's there? <laughs> That'd be good. And then I'm like, oh, but it's just another thing to try and get around something that I should just have enough self-discipline to not yeah. do. Do you know what I mean? Like, at what point do you stop buying things and just accept that it's just self-discipline? Yeah, exactly. I think that's the, the hardest thing. So I, I try to be very strict with myself, but inevitably it doesn't always work out. But, yeah, I yeah. hear that. Um, but I think that's who I am. I don't know. I think, yeah. It's a, a, a difficult question to answer about yourself. I suppose that's one that maybe other people have a, a you know, they build an image of what somebody is yeah. for you. Um, 
That's why I'm always interested in that question because what's perceived, and again, certainly through social media, and what's yeah. perceived about who someone is or what you hear about, oh, you should go and check out such and such because yeah. they are X, Y, and Z. I'm really interested in this podcast to be like, but who are you? Like, who, who actually are you? Like, well, so, I mean, in that regard, then I'm many more things, right? I'm not yeah. just a potter. I'm a, uh, I love cooking. I love sci-fi. I love uh, space. I love play, uh, being crap at chess. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I love to cook for my friends, all that kind of stuff. So uh, that's a whole other side of my life. But obviously that never comes across in, in your, well, it can in some people's socials, but I just, I prefer to keep that separate because yeah. I don't want to be, feel the need to share that kind of thing with the world and I, I, that's, yeah, that, that's your sp- I suppose that's, that's my sp- yeah. yeah that's quite interesting isn't it especially with someone that's amassed such a following I don't want to keep harping on about social media I do no, have questions sorry. about it later on but for someone that's amassed such a following and such a like transparency online for a lot of what you do like there is yeah. part of it that's very healthy I think personally and I'm, I'm open to hear your views on it that's, that's only healthy or actually unhealthy if you don't do it if you share that part as well. Like, yeah. There needs to be a hard line in the sand. Like, no, this is yeah. mass based. This Otherwise, it just bleeds into everything. Yeah. I think it's different if you're when you're actually like a, a celebrity where you're famous for being a personality. Mm. Because then your personal life kind of, it, it's, it's, it's far more blurred, the line. But when I, you know, my, I guess my renown is for my ceramics. It's not for things I do outside of that. So it's nice having that, that clear line, I think. Yeah, it's interesting. How did you set that clear line? Because ultimately, like, I, well, what you produce is brought on with all of your previous experiences. But how did you set that line in like? I'm a very introverted person. Okay. I've always been very... Uh... Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to I'm gonna confiscate it. <laughs> gonna confiscate it. <laughs> oh, that's my... Oh, that's my nice postcard. <laughs> um, I, you know, as, as much as I put myself out there these days to the point of, you know, being on telly, doing things on BBC or mm. uh, the Pottery Throwdown, I don't relish those experiences. I do it because I feel like it will be good for the business. But okay. I, I find them deeply stressful and nerve wracking and and I never think I'm going to be, you know, perform to the level I'd like. Mm. Um, and it's the same reason I'd never do much, you know, ca- uh, c- uh, camera, face to camera mm. content. Um, a narration is very nice because I can sit behind, you know, my desk. I've got my, my, my mic and I don't have to look at, you know, I'm not performing in such a way. But anyway, no, so I'm, I'm, I'm I, you know, I don't think I'm a great public speaker. I mumble over my words a lot. I, all these things and I just, um, I don't want to have to perform beyond. It's the same, okay, another reason is why, a lot, you know, Instagram lives or storing yourself where you're, you know, chatting to the camera. I just, I don't feel comfortable doing that. So I, I think there's part of me where I've had to create a way of kind of doing that, but without being such a, a, a personality, yeah. that makes sense. No, it does. It's interesting you say you don't think you're a great public speaker, because I watch a fair <laughs> bit of your narrations and they're very, very well spoken. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> The video I did last weekend, which was 26 minutes long, uh, it was about making a vase from yeah. beginning to end, one of these yellow guys, uh, yep. the iron covered pots. 26 minutes, uh, is the narration is made from over two and a half thousand audio attempts wow. of no me way. redoing the narration. Really? So then I'll splice sentences together. Um, it's really, it's constructed. You know, I'll say a sentence 10 times before I get it, the enunciation right, or if I, you know, when you're speaking with the little clicks and weird little noises, I have my headphones on. If I hear those, I'll re-record. And if I say something strange, I'll re-record it. Or if, you know, they're they're very. Um, <laughs> they're not. They're not. It's not just me sitting there and speaking for twenty six minutes. Yeah. You know, a narration can take me twenty twenty six minutes. Will maybe take me five or six hours to do. Wow. Um. So yeah, I mean that that's that's then you know I think people think they're quick and easy maybe, but they're not. But it's not uncommon though, is it? Because yeah, I think we're, it's not we're, uncommon. We're the same, like I'll record something like 10 times and like, it's still not right. Yeah, but you know what, then it makes me, when I have experiences with people who are professional, uh, like the, the times I've been on telly and there are the people who are the, you know, the, the guest, I mean the hosts of the show, yeah. and they just click, they're, they're, you know, they're told to do this sentence and they do it perfectly and you're like, how, like, how do you say it that well? 
you know, with that much energy and all this stuff, uh, click of a button. So, I mean, but that's their profession, right? So exactly. this is exactly it. You know, I listen to a lot of Modern Wisdom podcast and Chris Williamson, and I just think he speaks so eloquently. Mm. And, and he was talking about it in a podcast and he's like, well, I've got a vocal coach. I've got this, I've got that. And I'm like, oh, it all makes sense. <laughs> We're not all supposed to sound like super, no. but like your videos sound like, and I think there's a, again, talking about detached, there's a detach from like, five hours to do a 26 minute that's on the face of it madness but you know Mm. if that's what it takes that's what it takes it's also i also don't have a script so i'm i'm thinking of what to say as i go so often i'll stop for a few minutes and think about what my next sentence is going to be and um but yeah it's just the way i like to do it and of course i would love to be able to do it faster and without as much messing up but but that comes with time yeah exactly and it comes with time and it comes with practice i'm sure the first pot or mug you through didn't take exactly, as long as it does exactly. now. Yeah. Same, yeah, my first narrations are very monotone and I kind of just speak like this. But then people are like, oh God, I'm falling asleep to your voice. And I try to be a bit more, you know, I actively yeah. try to, you know, uh, speak a little bit more interesting than I might normally. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah. yeah. Do you view yourself and understand how interesting a person you are? Not really. Um, it's hard to, I mean, you know, I am what I am. I, 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 don't, I guess this has been maybe one of the interesting things with the book is writing about my story and then having other people read it because I've never done that before, really. Yeah. So then people reading and going like, you know, wow, that was really interesting. You know, what a story. But I, I, I've lived it. Again, it's all I've done since I was 15, I was 15 so like, I really don't know any, any different. Um, yeah. I mean, again, that's your perception of it. I, I, I don't, I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's, yeah, I know, and it's one of the things that Kate and I speak about, because you're absolutely right, like, when you live it, you know, we shot a documentary with Danny Bonner, a fantastic filmmaker, mm. in, um, like, November, and we released it, whenever we released it, and mm. it was the first, uh, April, two years ago, a year ago? It wasn't this year, it was last year, April. And it was one of the first times that I really, like we booked out the Scotsman Cinema in Edinburgh and uh, just like a little private show and it wasn't massively expensive, but it was one of the first times we forced ourselves to sit Mm -hmm. back and go like, whoa, us and the team have had a hand in this. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not something a lot of us do. No, no. Do you, you know, you've got a lot of exhibitions and stuff like that. Is that something you... Is that something for you that's a chance to stand back? Like walking into this workshop, I'm looking at thousands and thousands and (laughs) thousands of hours worth of work. Not just thousands of pots and pieces, but like thousands and thousands of hours worth of work. Yeah. You know, when you launch your shop on Sunday, which unfortunately this will go out just after that, but like that's not just X number of pieces. That's X thousands of hours worth of work. Do you ever take a step back and just be like, wow? Um, Truth be told, in the last couple of years, I haven't really had time to, to have a proper break. Um, but things like exhibitions where you're, you're putting your work into a physical space, they do make nice um, miles, you know, they are events. Yeah. Because I, I, I live in here all the time surrounded by tons of work and I don't really stop to think. I, it, I, I might fire and have a few pots that I really like that are different. Um, but when you have a proper exhibition, so I have a show in November at um, the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, um, which is, 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 it's launching at the same, well, a little bit after my book, but they have the same title, so they're both called By My Hands. Right. And um, that's going to be, thank you, a lot of you, <laughs> some people didn't, some people do. It's, it's been interesting seeing the response. Um, the, you know, that's going to be my biggest exhibition, also my first solo show in the UK. Um, so that's going to be, yeah, a chance to really stand back and look. But I, those are also events that I always, I dread. I, I look forward to them, but it's it's you know I'm putting your you, you put yourself on show, yes, yeah. and you're you're trying to work. I basically, I look at my work and I'm always ne- I, I never think it's as good as other people's, but I think that's probably everybody in every profession. So that's totally normal, by the way. It's totally normal. But yeah, but I you know I'm still absolutely there. Yeah, it's I don't think it will ever change. So I hope the work I produce will be good enough, and um, I hope people like it. I think any craftsperson is always trying to improve their work, always trying to make the next, you know, bigger, better, more interesting things. And it's, it's a very long journey. So, um, 
yeah, the exhibition, exhibitions are that chance to really slow down and stop and look. Yeah. And then maybe take a holiday. Maybe. Well, yeah, I, do, I know. I went to Japan recently for two weeks. Yeah. But, um, you know, Japan isn't really a holiday. You go there and you, you're up on your feet for two weeks. Yeah. You're doing twenty to 30,000 steps a day. So it, you're not relaxed. <laughs> no. um, uh, but I'm not very good at taking holidays. So I, I find it, again, if you're self-employed... Yes, that's I, hard. It's, it's hard to switch off. And again, because everything's on your phone the whole time... Everyone's you're, there. You're you almost need a holiday working. phone. <laughs> yeah, well, I was, yeah. you know, I th actually, when I went to Japan, I, for the first time in, in f since posting, so I've posted every single day since 2014. Yeah. I scheduled my content. It's a monolithic task. It's, it's, it, it, I think it just shows my borderline obsessive <laughs> compulsive disorder. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I'm very, I'm probably the prime example of like a dopamine obsessed, you know, <laughs> yeah. addicted uh Whatever, but no, I scheduled my content for two weeks, um, and I've never done that before in my life. And um, it was bliss. It was so nice not having to think about it. Um, you know, going out to dinner and just usually I post at seven pm every day, just not having to think about it. It, it was it was completely um, insane. It, 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 I mean, it doesn't sound like a big deal, but once you, if you've been doing that for you know since two thousand and fourteen, it's um, not having that thing in the back of your mind every single day is uh, wow. Would you not continue that for? Yeah, but then it's it's kind of it's 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 nice posting uh, about your work at the same time you're kind of making and doing. Mm. I'm more excited, you know. If I unpack a really nice kill note of work, I want to post about it straight away. That's yeah, it. yeah, okay. Because um, you're proud of that moment. Exactly. And you want to share. Um, so it's a bit trickier, um, but yeah, maybe maybe one day. I think one day I'll stop, um, but we'll see. Or just stop entirely. Yeah, I I don't think social media is going to last forever. Um, I think it's potentially dangerous to be your be you know people sometimes I think rely rely on it too much, mm -hmm. um, and for me it's obviously been this incredible tool that's helped propel my business and for thousands of other makers across the world you know people are being discovered who would probably never be discovered, mm -hmm. um, but at the same time I do feel it's. It's given me some bad traits. For instance, my attention is definitely dropped like a rock since I've started using it. Um, you know, I can't sit down and watch a movie by myself. I just, I will be on my phone in two seconds. I do not have the attention span to do it. I, but it's, it's, I, that wasn't always the case. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, we're really the exact same. I used I, to be fantastic at just switching your phone switching off. Switching yeah. off. Phone was put down. I mean, I didn't get a smartphone until our second year uni. Like, wow. Until we, like, I was... I was out was riding mountain bikes. Yeah, it was yeah. a proper brick. I was out riding mountain bikes, riding road bikes, out in the woods, like camping, whatever. Like that that was me. And then all, like, I in such a short know. space of time, I'm now exactly like you've just said. And it takes for people like that to say it, to be like, yeah, we don't watch films anymore. Yeah, it's hard. I can only watch them with, if, if, you know, with my partner and we're both off our phones. That's the only moment I can truly mm. watch and be, you know, in, in, in the moment. Um, yeah. But anyway, yeah, so I think maybe one day I'll stop because I do feel like to some degree it's um, just not good for the human condition. No. But but I, maybe I, that's a deep... I posted no, I yesterday on our it. social media about are we not being social anymore on it? Like, we're, mm. we're, I don't know, it's turning into this, like, always having to push what you're making and you're not actually being social with the people who are on your platform. Like, yeah. Do you know, that's an absolutely fantastic point, Kate. And it's a, actually, there's a good question for you. What is social media to you? Because Kate posted just the other day, mm -hmm. and you, Kate says to me the other day, you st we get frustrated with it. Obviously, it's the primary driving point of what we do is getting makers around the world elevated, rising tides, raise all ships. It's what we do, and that is our mm -hmm. the keystone in our bridge is yeah. social media, whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. And you turned to me the other day and go, you know the problem with social media is it's not social anymore. Mm -hmm. And yeah. our conclusion to that is, that's on us. Mm -hmm. Like that. That's on us as users, not making it social. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I guess when it becomes your again, it's, it's when it becomes your business, it becomes something else. Yeah. Mm. Right. Um, it's for me again. It's like what drives ninety percent of my traffic. Um, I'm sure it's where ninety percent of my sales come from. Um, but yeah, you know, when I was a teenager, I used it in a social way, but not anymore. Not anymore. And I don't think I would want to. I, I guess the, the social media, how I used to use it, is just, it's now just little chats with my friends. 
So now I have like a few different groups with different friends and we send each other pictures. So it's very internal, but I think maybe that's where it's gone um, rather than it being all this public, um, you know. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, I don't think it's, I mean, it's social and it's not social. It's strange. Yeah, it's um, strange. It's a strange one. I, I don't know. I don't know if I've got a right answer to it. I don't know if there is a right answer to it. Like, no, it just, I think it, it depends on how it. you use the, the platform ultimately. Yeah. Um, and when it's, again, when it's your business, it's just a whole different kettle of fish. It's, yeah. it's, it's totally, yeah, you're performing to some degree, right? And, yeah. and you do, you get pissed off, obviously, when things don't perform when you think they should. And obviously, I think it's become a much, generally speaking, it's become harder to, to use social media successfully because there's, you know, when I started in 2014, there was like no competition. It was so easy to go and gain followers. All I did was post hashtags. Hmm. My work, everything blew up. Everything got like 10, you know, thousands and thousands of likes. Um, and nowadays it's just way harder. But I, I don't know whether, I mean, it's because of tons of things, but... Um, you know, there were only 100 million users when I started. And now there's, what, a billion, yeah. 1.2 or something um, active users on Instagram. So there's just way more well, competition. It's, it's completely oversaturated. It's, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's scary. Anyway, that's why, yeah, I don't yeah. know. That's why part of me is kind of, it's, I was saying earlier, it's a double-edged sword. Like, I love it and I hate it. Yeah. And I think that's fine. Um, but yeah. do you understand the fact that, like, in the maker community, like, you and your account are monolithic in the makers community, <laughs> like monolithic. Yeah, it's funny. Um, I mean, it's not funny. I, 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 I guess... you obviously put a lot of work into it, so it deserves to be. Yeah, uh, um, I, you know, I, I, <laughs> I don't know how to. For me, it's just something I've done for for X amount of time, and it's 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 grown. How you know, I, I started posting and being on social media basically during my apprenticeship so I could show my mum and dad and my friends what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I didn't start it with the intention of it being a, you know, a way of sustaining my business. And it, since then it's just exploded. Um, but you know, it's hard work. It's a second job easily. Um, and and, and uh, yeah, I, I'm amazed every single day that there are people on the other side of the world who watch what I do. You know, I had a visitor from the US the other day, a student mm -hmm. who's, um, in COVID, he started watching my YouTube videos. He put a pottery wheel in his house and now that's what he wants to do for, for, a, for a living. And he's 18. So um, stories like that made me maybe yeah. Yeah, reflect on that and go like, holy crap. Like, What have I done? Well, <laughs> well you know, there's going to be so many pots. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just insane that that's happened. Right, it's um, Th those little things are big things. Aren't yeah, yeah, those yeah. little things are. You know, we got asked a while back, what what does success look like for us? Yeah, and I had to defer the question. Like we we couldn't answer at the time, but on reflection and answering the question, like if someone then comes to us in ten, fifteen years' time, saying I've been doing, take this for example, I've been doing pottery for fifteen years because I yeah. watched your podcast with Florian Gadsby. Like that to us is success, and like yeah. if you're using it in the the right way, whether it's social or not, but you're using it as a chance to share your work and that inspires someone, mm -hmm. that's one of the good things. So yeah, that, I mean, that's the best thing about social media. If, it, if, if, if the work produced makes even one person take up the craft and change their life and do something they love, then it's successful, yeah. right? Um, but yeah, no, I just think it's kind of, it's all a bit funny, isn't it? <laughs> but it's weird that, again, I feel like I'm an introverted Brit who has a small studio in London, yet somehow there's this audience of almost four million people around the world and it's sort of like how why <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. it's pottery what's so special about it so um so you know the yeah. thing and i say it to a lot of people with smaller accounts as well and like like we're thirty thousand or whatever on instagram and like you talk like four million people like across all your platforms could you imagine putting four million people in Twickenham, your local stadium? <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't go, I'd be too scared. <laughs> it's, that's what we, it's bonkers, isn't it? It's yeah, absolutely but bonkers. I mean, again, uh, sometimes I don't know how to even gauge those numbers because I know that you... It's quite intimidating when you... It is, but also I, I, I don't know how much of it is real, right? And also, for, I, think, I feel like the YouTube audience and the Instagram audience are pretty genuine. But since Shorts has been introduced and since TikTok, you know, my biggest following is on TikTok, right? 1.8 million people but I know for a fact that 90% of that they're not really a I don't want to say genuine audience but um, they're probably not going to purchase my work they're probably not actually interested in the pieces I make 
they saw a couple of videos that went massively viral and you know and just followed they're not actually invested in in in, in you as an artist so yeah. it's nice having these numbers sometimes you know but i do feel like they can give people a false um uh perception of how successful they are right and power it gives power which is crazy right because it's just numbers so uh, yeah. people see you know 1.8 million and go holy shit you know he's so famous block but I, I don't think it really works like that it doesn't affect the way you do your craft no and I, 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 it can inflate egos and it can make people feel you know bigger than they actually are when in reality it's just a bunch of numbers and clicks from a person who watched your video for 10 seconds so again i try not to get focused on things like that mm -hmm. um but it's very difficult not to. So it's it's yeah, it's hard. Well, it is. It's part of it's part of life now. Yeah. One thing you mentioned there, and one thing I want to put a lot of impetus on because this is real world time under tension that you've spent is the apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. You know, it was one thing to talk about all that social media and all the all the good looking polished stuff, which has obviously got its place, but you'd done nearly ten years worth of collected apprenticeships, did you not? Between, so, was, he, was it Rudolf Steiner you were at originally? So, I mean, not, not quite 10. So, I mean, no, well, so I did, um, I went to a Waldorf Steiner school. Mm -hmm. Do you know about Waldorf Steiner education? Yeah, a little bit. So, I mean... Do, do explain it though, because so, I mean, the truth. So, I mean, in simply put, in the past, it's kind of a very big thing to unpack. I do, in my first chapter in the book, I uh, talk about my experiences there, historically what it was, and then what I got out of it. Because historically, you know, it came from kind of a strange place. There were lots of positives about it. Right. Um, you know, he really loved craft. So in my education, um, we, pla you know, we learned, before we did any maths, we learned how to knit. Um, and we would knit wow. these little um, pouches that we put conkers in, but that we collected from the garden. And then we would use those conkers to do, uh, you know, addition and subtraction. And then we would knit recorder cases um we would learn how to crochet and then we would do woodwork and then we would um build prehistoric huts and we would learn to, to flint nap and do um, yeah, yeah, yeah. thatched roofs we would carve marble we would then learn how to farm and we would plow fields with kids pulling plowshares <laughs> right we would uh, plant trees in class one that then in class 13 we went and picked pears from um Wow. We would do woodwork, metalwork, ceramics, fine art, fail painting, stained glass. Um, and all of that was as important as maths and science and English. And um, I feel like I'm very lucky to have undergone that education because it is private. Um, it's not ludicrously expensive. It kind of, it's scaled. So kindergarten is, you know, a grand and a half or two grand. And then every year it gets a bit, a bit more expensive, right? Um, I wish every school taught craft to the same degree because I, 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 it's um, you know I feel like it's an, an, an important thing to understand how the world works beyond just you know it's nice knowing how clothes are made or we went and visited local farms, mm -hmm. um, milk cows, went and collected eggs. As kids, then we understand where our food came from. We also grew our own vegetables, right? So. You, you gain an understanding of the world and an appreciation of the objects that you kind of surround yourselves with from an early age. And I think a lot of people take much of that for granted these days, but of course it's, you know, not everyone it's, it, it's, it's, that comes from a privileged position because it was an expensive school. And, you know, of course not everyone can be expected to, I don't know. It's so I, I, I have a conflicted, hmm. I would, I would love everyone to go through the Waldorf Stein education, but I don't feel like private education is necessarily a good thing. Hmm. I just feel like that should be the school system that everyone gets the chance to undergo for free. Yeah, um, financials weren't an issue. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, the school was like that. And we also, you know, we, paint, we, we did tons of theatre productions where we built sets. Before I became a ceramist, I almost wanted to be like, a, I wanted to do either graphic design or set building. Right. Um, so craft was just, you know, thrown at us. Um, so that's, oh, I forget what the age it, it, Yeah, so I was in Wolof Steiner from, um, six years old until I was 19. So classes one to 13, is, right. we do it in a Steiner system. We also do everything one year later and okay. GCSEs are spread out over two years, um, which is kind of nice because it means you can focus more and you can do more and you can, it means you go to universities like a slightly older child, but 
who, who cares? Right? Yeah, yeah, quite. Um, so I did that, and then I did. Um, I spent loads of time going around the UK looking for courses, um, university courses, and all I really wanted to do was learn how to make pottery. So I wanted to know how to make plates and teapots and you know bowls. I wanted to know how to throw on the wheel and fire kilns. Mm. I wanted practical tangible skill hands-on stuff hands-on you know and i just kept going to places and this was in 2011 and 2012 and everywhere was just conceptual um this was before craft really exploded back into the forefront um and became popular again which i feel like i can say quite confidently it's gone undergone that kind of change I think so. yeah um and, you know, I went to all these unis and there was just a wheel in the corner of the room covered in dust. And I'd be like, oh, you know, so I really want, I'm really interested in learning to throw. And they'd be like, okay, I, you know, we'd have to maybe get a tutor to come in once a week. Is that okay? Um, you know, we don't really focus on throwing here. It's more of like a conceptual art-based thing. I was just like, <laughs> and I got really, um, I don't want to use the word depressed. I wasn't depressed, but I was just, um, I was sad. I was sad that what I wanted to do, I wouldn't be able to do. And um, there was something stopping you. There was something stopping me. And it's, it's, you know, that was even Stoke and Trent, you know, the home of British ceramics industry. Yeah. And they had two wheels in there. And so I just was like, Christ, if I can't do throwing there, what the hell am I going to do it? Anyway, I ended up going to this ceramic fair with my mum. And I was very nervous. You know, I didn't want to talk to any of the, <laughs> the, um, the potters. But we, we ended up talking to this guy called Tim Hearn. And he mentioned this course in Ireland, um, which is called the DCCOI Ceramic Skills and Design Training Course. Um, the Design and Crafts Council of Ireland Ceramic Skills and Design. It's a mouthful. <laughs> um, and he went, oh, and one of the ex-students is just, you know, across on the other side of the room. So I went and chatted to him and he told me about this course in Ireland that was, it's two years. It's free. The Irish government pays you. It's entirely focused, you know, on, on, in, in giving people the fluency and craft and skill. Um, and I was like, oh my God, it's perfect. Um, and the way I describe it and the way I hate describing that course is, um, but it kind of, it paints a good picture of it is it's like the Hogwarts of the pottery world. <laughs> it's like this old, beautiful building. You're, the teachers are world-class. There's this glazed lab. It's all kind of, it's in a beautiful old Irish ta uh, village nice. right by the river. Um, bless. <laughs> it was bliss. But, um, so I, I had to then apply to that course, um, do interview aptitude test. Uh, I did not think I was going to get on. In fact, I didn't. I remember leaving the aptitude test. And they're like, we'll be in touch with you in two weeks. You know, we'll send a letter if you're successful. Oh, yeah. I never got anything. And then all I got, like, a couple of months later, we graduated, you know, graduated school. I got an email saying, like, this is, you know, the successful students. Here's a list of all your emails so you can get in touch and talk about, you know, um, sorting out accommodation with each other. I was like, I got it. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't think I got it. So you didn't get any of the previous I didn't get, stuff. I didn't get anything that they said I was going to get. Um, but you got the email to say the email chat to, to say, your classmates. Yeah, so I was a bit like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> um, so yeah, that was a two-year course. Um, in my eye, that is, it was the best ceramics course in Europe by far. Um, the teacher, you know, Gus Mabelson, who was the, the guy who spearheaded that course, is, he, he's a, I mean, he's, he's kind of, he approached it from quite an academic way. He was very strict but he was so good at um, imparting skill and just showing you how to do things. But the course was kind of set up in the first year. They did not, am I allowed to swear? Are you, sure? you do you, it's your just podcast. Just the way I say it. I mean, the, you know, in the first year, they don't give a shit about your aesthetic opinion. Right. The, the only thing they care about is making you good at throwing pots. Mm. So you might hate the pots you're making. And a lot of them did feel kind of dated, weird designs with like moldings around the base, but they were pots that made you good at making pots. Ah, okay. Interesting. Um, so they were, they were skill-based pieces. They were not... skill-based, right. you know, they involved throwing, um, putting a mold around the base, you know, various different handles, but they taught, so the first year was basically just, we want to make you good. We want to give you fluency. We want to make you understand how to make pottery and how to mix glazes, how to fire kilns. So just, sorry, just to interject. Yeah. So you opted to do this over university at that point you just you didn't go to university no. you graduated school and then you went I went to straight this here. course mm. right wicked um, I mean that's the best decision I ever made in my life as far as I'm aware um, because it gave me a, a you know you, I'm not saying that everybody needs a, a thorough base of skill no but it does help you know being able to make and do a lot of things mm. even if it's if you're learning and making things you don't like it, just having that basis of 
understanding is so important. And um, yeah, so, and then in the second year they go, okay, now, you know, now we know you can make pots. What do you want to make? And then they would completely just let you go down the path you wanted and they would help nurture your style and your aesthetic. Um, you know, there would be critique and there was a lot, quite a lot of harsh critique, mm -hmm. um, but it was all done in, you know, to make you a better maker, a more interesting craftsperson to make your work stand out. And um, it was perfect. Uh, those were the, probably the happiest two years of my life. And I look back on it and I just, I miss it. And it was also the last kind of time in my life. Again, I don't want to go back to social media all the time, but no, of course. I wasn't posting every day. My, my, all I was focused on was learning and hanging out with my, my new, you know, you know, new university. They say with universities where you meet your like, friends for life, right? Yeah. Often. This was the first time I met, I was in, in Steiner. I was the only person doing pottery. I had no one else I could talk to pots about. Where then I went here, and then suddenly I had a whole group of people who could talk. That's really I could talk to. And I was, it was, I, 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 you know, I changed a lot as a person in those two years. Um, and it was just a, a, a massive point in my life. Um, mm. So yeah, it's funny you say that this way. You meet friends. That's where Kate and I. Kate oh, and really? I met week one of university. Wow. We've been married two years and been together nearly twelve years now. Mm. Wow. So there you go. Some, yeah. some truth to it somewhere. Well, no, I think that is. Uh, I wish I saw the, my friends there more often, but they, you know, we all live, some of them live in Austria. Um, some of them work in um, Witchford as a thrower. In, um, you keep in touch. And... We keep in touch, yeah. yeah. But um, they bully me for not coming and seeing them enough, but I, I should. <laughs> um, so two years there, second year being very much open studio. Yeah. And was it people from all over Europe going to this little village in Ireland to learn pottery? So yeah, the, the way the course, so they, they allowed 12 new students every two years. Okay. So it's really, it's very, um, and I think, I think at the time, because the course is free, and actually the year I went was the first year you got accreditation, so they linked with NUI Maynooth, the, the university, National University of Ireland. Mm -hmm. So we got paid by the Irish government and we got a degree out of it. I still don't oh, really, cool. know, I don't know what that degree is. It's level eight in Irish terms. I don't know what no, that equates to in the UK. They're all um, different, aren't they? So if anyone listening, if you know. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah can we please um, help for it out and work out what a level what is it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, uh, yeah, so 12 people every two years. Yes, and applications were open to the all of Europe. So there we had a Greek girl, there were two... English, me and Steve, my, um, Pete, my friend from Northern Ireland, um, a bunch of Irish, and then uh, Slovenian girl. But yeah, there have been caught. There have been, there have been years where there was, you know, German, French. Yeah. Um, Sounds it, great. It was Sounds fantastic. It was perfect. I mean, sadly oh, now it's closed and it's changed. It's rejigging itself and becoming something slightly different. Um, but, you know, it taught a generation of brilliant throwers and yeah. makers. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was two years. Then I did a three-year apprenticeship with um, Lisa Hammond in London. Um, and I remember thinking, like, God, the thing I did in Ireland was really hard. That was, like, hard, you know, hard work. And then this was a whole other thing. I was like, oh, my God, like, this is a job <laughs> for two or three people. Yeah. Um, and then I finished that. And then I went to uh, Japan for six months. This is the interesting bit. So, I mean, that was, it was... I'm sure it's all interesting. Yeah. Just it was, like Japan just well, fascinates I get, it, me. It's, it's like, it's, it's where um, pottery feels so alive there in a, in a way it doesn't right. anywhere else in the world. Okay. Um, and so Lisa helped organise that trip mm -hmm. um, because it's very hard to, to get an apprenticeship in, in Japan um, with a, a potter like Ken Matsuzaki. You need, you, need a, you need someone to kind of make Can a connection. connection yeah. mm. um, and that was only six months. And again, I remember th doing that and thinking, Christ, what I was doing with Lisa was easy. Um, but maybe it was just because I was learning and doing different things, right? Um, but just, It's exponential, isn't it? Like every step of doing things, it just gets steeper and steeper and steeper. Yeah, and the Japanese worth work ethic is real. Um, you know, we worked eight in the morning until 5.30 in the evening. Then we would go home and have a two hour break for dinner and then I would come back to the studio and work from um, 7.30 until 10 or 11, uh, six days a week. So, um, and I've, you know, I feel like it's great being passionate and focused and doing what you love, but I do also think there is a, a limit to how much you should work. Mm -hmm. And I think not being able to have a social life is detrimental to your work life. Yeah. So for a six month apprenticeship for me, it was perfect. I found 
portions of it very difficult because I, I you know, I, I lived and breathed pots every single day. I couldn't escape it. Um, but then, you know, that's their culture. So I think, you know, for, for them, the people out there who are doing longer apprenticeships. So Ken's main apprentice now, he's done 10 years. He's now doing another 10 years. Wow. Um, I mean, it's not an apprenticeship. I, I think they're still calling it an apprenticeship. I might be wrong, but it's not an apprenticeship at that point. You're no. an assistant, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's the dedication of what they're willing to do to, 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 to learn a craft. Yeah. Wow. These... Japanese craftsmen, and, and um, we've um, interviewed some swords maker for the book and stuff, and it just, it feels like that's just life. Like everything else is consequential to fitting around craft. What did that do for you as a craftsman going over there? Like, as you say, so it feels like that six months would have either made it, which it did, mm. or break it for you. You'd have either been like, no, too much. Burnt out. Yeah. Mm. I couldn't work in the same capacity they do here. Right. Um. I work a lot, but I I, I just couldn't. It, it, I would burn out. Um, I think they have just a different. Um, they just have a different approach, and um, I guess traditionally, because uh, because the, their craft cultures are so based in tradition, mm. the importance of keeping those traditions alive and healthy. Um, it, it remains, you know, that exists in a way that we don't have here, really. So um, I've lost my train of thought. Where are we going? We were talking we going? about, you know, had you only been there for six months, that would have made or break broke yeah. what you do and you couldn't work that way here. Yeah. I feel like if I tried to work that way here, my friends would um, have a go at me. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Or my family would be like, can you come over, you know, for a dinner on Sunday? They do still socialise, but it's... it's um, Doi, who was the apprentice when, when I was there, he's it's almost as if he's taken on like a monastic way of life. Mm. He's committed to this thing beyond just doing it as a job. Right. Um, he does it to, um, you know, he, he drives Ken around. He's a chauffeur in some regards. He's there all day, every day. He will go and run errands. It's, it's... Sounds all consuming to me, though. Yeah. It, it is all consuming, but it's, it's, the, it's uh, much of it is that's their tradition and that's how they've done it. You know, and Doi is, he's guaranteed now, because of doing this apprenticeship with Ken for X amount of years, when he sets up on his own, he'll be successful. Right. No matter what, because he's had, he's worked from that lineage. Um, but I feel like... If ah, I, okay, so is it a continuation of lineage type of thing that Doi's invested into? Well, I mean, I guess the same thing here, right? If you work for a very famous potter, you do have that attached to you to some degree. Yeah. So I do have Lisa forever attached to me as she's somebody I learned and, and, and she, you know, she taught me, I was her apprentice. Yeah. But I think in Japan, it's much more serious. So Ken Matsuzaki, he was the apprentice to Shimoka. Shimoka was a national living treasure in Mashiko and he was the apprentice to Soji Hamada. Soji Hamada is the, um, you know, one of the four figures of the Minge crafts movement. So, right. and now, so you've got um, Hamada, you've got then Shimoka, you've got Ken Matsuzaki and you've got Doi. So that's this four, you know, person lineage and people still think about where you came from even if it's that long you know more than there's 100 still years ago. skills that have come from yeah and it's all and, the way down yeah and and the fact that doi has you know you apprenticeship in that lineage it it it's important mm. and that's you know, that's that's japan that's their tradition they care and that's why their craft is so good because they care about where it came from they care about preserving skill and you know they have ta you know in, in 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 Japan there's ten or more towns that are completely focused on making pots. Uh -huh. Each town has its own specific uh, style, you know, genre of pottery. Yeah. And they've been doing that for hundreds of years, and that just does not exist in the UK. Yeah. I mean, we might have it in very small. We used to have it. Uh, yeah, I was going to say well, what what did exist that was as close to that has just gone now. Yeah, we don't. But like you, you know, were saying, stuck on trip was like the yeah, capital exactly. of pot making ever. And you went into the university there. And there's a potter's wheel in the corner. Yeah, I mean, it's better, it is better now. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But they, just, they, ha they have craft on a, on a level that we just do not have. And I don't think we're ever going to have. I don't think we're ever going to be on the level that the Japanese... Um, you know, they can take things like uh, whiskey making, mm -hmm. which isn't their tradition. And they... Because they can dedicate themselves to making cra you know, craft to such a high degree that I think... I mean, for you guys especially, they won something like best whiskey in the world a few years ago. 
right? It's wild. It's not their tradition, but I think because they can take their appreciation for craft and their hyper focus on making it perfect, mm -hmm. um, they're capable of doing that. And I, I just don't think anywhere, I don't think anywhere in the UK or Europe or the US is ever going to have a comparable appreciation for craft. It might not be necessarily healthy in some regards in terms of work ethic and how many hours you put in, but I feel like their craft it will be will be preserved in a way that um, will not exist in other parts of the world. Do you miss it? Yeah, I miss it a lot. I, I mean, I just went back for two weeks. Um, it's a it's a, a glorious place. It's um, the way to, I like to sum it up very simply is you know we we're on the train in rush hour in Tokyo and there was a group of eight kindergartners going to school with no adults. Really. Would that happen in, you know... No. <laughs> if, if your society is that safe, where you don't have to lock your doors, um, you can leave your laptop in, your, in, a, in a cafe. We saw a guy, we were having coffee. He left his, like, nice Apple, you know, laptop on the table for easily 40 minutes outside the cafe on a, on a main road in Tokyo. Really? Yeah. Um, we were watching, like, oh, my God, what is it? no one came. No one even blinked tonight. Um, and if your society has got to a point where you're that, uh, 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 I don't say appreciative of your, you know, you're respectful of your peers, mm. that's a very nice thing. Yeah. And um, I'm not saying Japan is perfect because I know there are other issues, right? Yeah, Decline in population, I mean, other things, working too hard. But just having that simple respect for your, for your fellow humans is such a nice thing to experience. And just yeah. feeling safe. Mm, all yeah. the time I never yeah. for one you know we walk around really late at night in areas that it was Tokyo they you know they didn't feel like they were they were kind of some semi semi industrial areas but at not one point did I ever feel unsafe that's fantastic um whereas in the UK like even here where I live I live in Archway walking around late at night sometimes I'm like oh, bloody hell it's a bit dodgy like what's yeah. going on here um, and that's your home that's my home so I just you know I go there and I I I, I They've grown up. Ken said to me, I asked him this once, I said, like, why is it in Japan? There's, no, there's like no graffiti. Everyone's like gardening on Sundays, just making the town look beautiful. What's going on? Everyone's so nice. And he's like, well, we've just grown up. Doing that. Yeah. Not just grown up. I think, well, I think he meant as a country. Grown up. Oh, right. Yeah. Right, think, okay. Yeah, I think they've just, they've grown up. So, I, yeah, that stuck with me. And um, I miss it. Mm. I'll bet you do. But I would not live there. Right, okay. So you would choose that that's interesting. Choose, like, yeah. It's just different culture, isn't it? It's just different culture. Yeah. Nice I find it interesting that you speak so fondly, but you wouldn't live there. I think because I've grown up as a Brit, mm. um, I mean, there are things, again, like it's, you know, hyper-bureaucratic. Right. Um, when I lived there for six months, I... The recycling... I mean, this is such a petty thing, but I remember thinking, like, it's just... Um, tins had to go in the cyan plastic crate not the blue one right and one day i didn't know this was like my first week there i saw everyone else outside put their crates with all their tins outside um you know their cans and things and i put mine but i put them in the wrong color but the material in the in the crate was all the same right so we're all recycling our you know our, our cans and tins mine which my so mine were just in the wrong colored receptacle but it was still all tins in it still so same as what everyone else was recycling and they refused to take it and i got a red letter on my door saying and then I translated my phone like saying you have to you know use the correct color and I, I just thought like I understand but come on Don't the only difference <laughs> is yeah but the only difference is the color of the receptacle yeah nothing else was wrong so there, there are things like that that happened where you're like oh my god just you know get on with it mm. it's not going to make you know it doesn't make anyone's life harder if you just but um anyway it's kind of funny I those are the things I remember though and I'm, I'm fond of those memories because yeah. it's sort of ridiculous and um I wonder if the view as <laughs> yeah. well, that would just be the start. Yeah. What would you do after you've done that? Like, that's the start of a, a terrible decline if you put it in the wrong container. Yeah. But then, you know, then, it lasts, then, then the six months following that, I was hyper aware of, like, what are other people doing? I need to make sure I'm doing, you know, exactly what they're doing. And I think that's partly why they are very good at, you know, in terms of learning craft, they're, they observe... If they're following, you know, their make, their master maker and apprentice, they, they're watching what they do. Mm. They really watch and they watch what you're doing. They watch the tools you use. They see how you're holding them, how you use them. So I, I think there's a, a slightly different way of observing the world um, that they're quite good at. Right. 
um, just possibly just from that lineage. I thing, think so. Yeah. Just being, yeah, very. Yeah. I don't know. What What about the so totally selfish question? Because I'd love to go out there and and do exactly this. But what are the people like out there? Like, do you think there's a world where you could go out and do this kind of thing with makers? Because it feels a bit more closed. But that's only what I'm seeing from literally I think now, thousands I, of miles. I think nowadays it's better. Right. Um, it's, it's, every potter I met in Mashko was bloody lovely. They were nice. so nice. They would invite me into their shop or their home. They would give me tea or beer or... Nice. Um, I think people were a little bit... You know, Mashko was a smaller town. It's not Tokyo. In Tokyo, there's so many tourists that people are just accustomed to. Mashko was smaller and people did stare at me. And people were a bit apprehensive sometimes. But everyone went out of their way to help me at all times. That's and awesome. everyone I sp- yeah, if, if someone could speak English, they wanted to talk to me and they wanted to talk about craft. Um, they're also very interested in Western life, right? Um, Western culture is really uh, latched on in Japan. It, it's become more of a thing like celebrating Christmas or even celebrating your birthday. They don't, you know, those weren't things that they do, but now they are things they do. And I think generally um, they'll be totally happy. They're, you know, they're like anyone else. People like talking about themselves, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think there's no difference. I think it would, it would be obviously harder to, to make um, the connections and find people to talk to, but that's simply because it's a different culture and it's harder to, to, to talk. You know, you'd, yeah. you'd need someone to... Um, I, the actual language barrier yeah, would yeah, be yeah, difficult. Yeah, yeah, I hear yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I maybe need to learn Japanese. <laughs> which feels like that'd be very hard. Did you learn much <laughs> Japanese when you were there? No. Uh, <laughs> admittedly, Ken speaks really good English. His daughter spoke fluent English. Oh, wow. And she works at Mashko Ceramics Museum. So she was kind of on hand to, to handle any more complex discussion we needed to have. Oh, yeah. cool. And Doi, the apprentice, he said he didn't speak any, any English. But as time went by, he, he understood what I said. So he knew. He knew um, and he got better really quickly. Over six months, Like I would say something and he would be like, hi, hi. Like, he knew what I was. So anyway, um, no, I learned basic. Yeah. Um, but I wasn't there to learn a language. And if, if I, I, I think it had, I had the choice again, I would have learned the language before I went right. or, you know, the basics. Mm. But I was there to, to learn how to make pots and see their way of life and their way of craft, really. So it's interesting, the language thing, isn't it? Because that's one thing when we went to Norway, we stayed in Norway for six months. Yeah. Um, and it's one thing I wish. So we were pursuing mm. Kate Woodwork, me metal work in a cool. Norwegian university. And it's one thing I wish I'd done, was learn just and in hindsight, I feel quite ignorant that we didn't. Yes. And we've got a really good friend, Ben Geisler, who's a saddle maker. That's actually who we're going out to stay with in the States. And, you know, I witness him going into Mexican supermarkets or taquerias or... Just speaking Like language. Hispanic places or, or the um, the Chinese place and the Korean place. Mm. And mm. it doesn't know loads, but it knows just enough. And you just see the warmth that comes through in people just because he's made the effort. Mm. Now, they'll often retort in English after the initial conversation. Really? But it's just, it opens doors. It definitely opens doors. Yeah, and you, you experience the world in a totally different way, don't you? Like, Absolutely. I, I always felt like I was missing out on something. Mm. Um, and obviously I was, like all the conversations I missed, that, I mean, you know, I missed out probably, had I learned the language, I would have learned easily 100% more, I think. Really? Yeah, because there's, uh, there's so many things that they can tell you that are, the subtleties that, you know, Ken did explain things to me, but it was in... Pretty good English, but I'm sure if I... Wasn't your mother tongue at the time, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I would have learned way more, culturally and, and for the craft, so. So what happened after? So six months there, then yeah. you come, you, did you, you came back to the UK I came back to I came back to London, and the idea was to set up a studio, so, um, and, you know, do it myself, because I'd, I'd always worked in other people's studios, basically. So um, I spent the better part of almost two years trying to find somewhere. I mean, London oh. isn't a very good place to be a craftsperson. It, the craft is very popular, but um, yeah, I, I wanted to work in East London. I have lots of friends there who are uh, artists, craftspeople, painters, potters, mm. chefs, right? Um, but it seems like most of the spaces were just being set up for um, desks to be put in, in computers, or people want spaces where to, to you know, there would be like, we only allow painters. Yeah because it's quite an easy, you know, you don't need much infrastructure as a painter, you just, yeah. I'm not throwing shade at them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, but they didn't want someone coming and cutting a hole no, on a roof. Well, exactly. For a... So um, it was hard. I looked at so many places that were, um, you know, I had this long list on my desktop of just 
websites and every morning I would open it and trawl through them and look at every single new listing. Um, but so many of the places, you know, there were, there were studios that were up a flight of stairs, down a corridor. They didn't have water access. They didn't have their own toilet. Um, they wouldn't, they, they, you know, the idea of a gas kiln was crazy. Uh, <laughs> all this stuff. And I was really just, I, th I was thinking like, crap, I'm going to have to, you know, find a studio that's small. I'm going to have to stop gas firing. You know, the thing I'd spent the last seven years learning to do, I'm just going to have to pack it in. Um, and then I just saw this place um, in High Barnet, which isn't a place I, you know, High Barnet's kind of a weird part of London. I like it because it feels like it's a, almost like a seaside town. Out, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's very not London. Well, a weekend trip away. Yeah. It's right at the end of the tube line. It's, I mean, you know, five minutes that way is the edge of London. Yeah. Um, but it's so peaceful. It's ground floor access. You know, my landlord didn't really, you know, that was my condition. I said, I can, you know, I'll only move in if you allow me to put a chimney through the roof. And he's like, fine. Um, so I looked, and you know, I found I found this place, and I did not think I was going to get it because um, there were a few people who came to see it. Um, but I think because I told the letting agent kind of my story, and I've been looking for so long, he was on my side, which great. is great. That's what you need. Um, so yeah, I've been here now since 2019. So I mean, I, I got it, and then basically COVID hit. Um, and all my family, my girlfriend, we all moved to my mum's house. She lives in North London. Um, and I spent, you know, months just cycling uh, 12 miles a day to the studio and back, which was on empty London roads, which was at heaven. Yeah, I'll bet. Um, that must have been really eerie and weird. It was it, yeah. honestly the nicest. Um, it was so nice. It was so <laughs> quiet. Because I don't know, you know, London's a horrible place to drive, horrible place to cycle. Um, so it was bliss. Yeah. Um, Covid wasn't bliss, no. but the that brief moment because obviously I couldn't work Silver from home. Yeah, um, and then that's what I've been here since. Um, it's a great space. It's good. I mean, yeah, it's it's it's. I I feel like I have maybe outgrown it, but it's also just quiet. It's peaceful. It's very quiet. You're not getting um, traffic past. No traffic or... noise. Yeah. The only thing we have is an airfield near, nearby, so there are some days where all you can hear is like <sighs> droning of planes and helicopters and things. Yeah. Um, but it's perfect. I'll stay here for as long as I can, um, ideally. Why did you come back to London? Why London? Because like all the things you've just explained, mm. this is obviously rent's higher here, yeah. finding place to even rent's harder. Why come back here? My family, I think. Right. So this, this is what you've seen as home. This is where the family was. So that's, I, that I've, lived, I've lived in London since I was um, five years old. Right. So I, I was born in Norfolk in Great Yarmouth and we lived in the countryside for a while but then we moved back to the city and I, I've been here ever since so it feels like home it's where all my friends are mm. well you know 90% of my friends um, and part of me does think like I would love living in the countryside right I can have land and space um, I can build kilns um, and then there's part of me that just loves city life um, exhibitions so you know, um, there's just stuff to do people to see yeah. and I think for running a business as well and because my audience is so global it's kind of helpful being in London because it makes it easier to visit for people who are visiting right. not that I have that many visitors and I try not <laughs> I, try, oh. um, I try not to I love having visitors don't get me wrong but if I said yes to every single visitor I would have someone here every day of the week mm. and you're not going to work if someone's here every day of the week right so um uh, but no, but it's, it means that it's easily commutable. People can come here relatively easily. So um, it's just where I, it's what I know. Transport links are quite yeah. good. They are good here. Transport links, especially to exactly where you are. We don't have to drive through London to get here. Oh, yeah. So this just, is that's, that's easy. And from the point of view of your support network, that mm -hmm. must be immensely immensely important having that around you it's yeah. one thing yeah you could go and move up to you know you could find a property to say around our place that probably costs a year what this place would imag i'd imagine costs to rent that would cost that yeah you know and but if you've not got that support network especially with the amount of output you're mm -hmm. doing or the mm -hmm. amount of output i perceive that you do yeah i don't think you could do it no and uh, you know i was gonna say really cheesy then <laughs> uh you only live once. I'd rather live somewhere that um, my friends are around and my family's around and there are things to do. I hear that. If if I live, you know, if my family lives somewhere else and they're countryside based, maybe I'd not be like that. Yeah. Um, but that's just how life's how life's gone, right? Yeah. Um, it's something we often talk about. You know, we live 
in the countryside. I mean, mm. twenty minutes drive into Glasgow, but it is very countryside. And we we often look at is there a world, especially because we're out and about and travel so yeah. much. Is there a world where we move more into the city? Is there? But it's like it's really hard to give up the countryside. Yeah. It is. The countryside. I, I can imagine. Yeah, I go to my dad. He lives in Somerset, and it's yeah. he lives. He's like one neighbour, <laughs> and it's just farms and um, fields and forests around him, and it's. It's so peaceful and lovely, but it's um, also it. disconnected. And yeah. but I, I, I think I don't mind. Is is the way I truthfully see it. I, I I imagine if I lived there and I can make it work, I would love it. Yeah. So I'm not I'm not I'm not like hyper like I'm a city boy. Yeah. By any means, I, I feel like I could do both, but. But this is where you are. This, this is where moment. I am at the moment in yeah. this part of my life, and I'm yeah. happy with that. So 2019, you moved in here. How mm-hmm. has it looked since you moved in here? Like, what what's that journey looked like? Because elephant in the room, COVID was a thing, mm-hmm. which meant your cycle was great. But yes. what does that mean for everything else? Well, it didn't really affect my business. Um, that's when I also started making YouTube videos, um, okay. which I think helped because people were at home and they couldn't get tuition in person. So I started making, um, you know, videos that were more focused on like you know the i have a series called the beginner's guide and it takes you through learning how to throw from the ground up like hyper hyper detailed you know excruciatingly so um but covid didn't really affect my business because well do you remember like people were buying more things online right yeah stuff for their home i make pottery um sales didn't change or take a dip um so really not much changed it was quieter for sure um, in terms of just my life, but sales and, you know, social media still, you know, going up, everything was the same. Um, yeah. Did you actively make that beginner's course because you knew? Was that about a good foresight on you or was that just how it happened? The way I looked at it is when I started learning how to make pottery, I used to learn as much as I could at school from my teacher. Mm-hmm. And then I would go home and I would go on YouTube and I watched Simon Leach videos you know, this, you know, their videos are 12 years old. Mm-hmm. So I like the idea of having, I thought I'm making content about pottery, about how to make mugs and bowls and teapots. I may as well produce a how-to beginner's guide because people are going to watch it. Mm. So then I went and I watched everybody else's how-to guides and I thought, what can I do different or, or better? Um, oh. Excuse me. Um, and... Uh, I, I, you know, I made videos with mm, different camera angles, close-ups. Mm. It showed the same processes various times from different, you know, learning to throw is a very strange thing because you're using your fingers in a way that you've never done before properly, right? You're holding your knuckle like bent down at a weird angle. And if, if you're watching that through a screen, if someone only shows you one angle, it's actually very difficult to see what's going on. So yeah, I tried to- How do to, I replicate that from yeah, my it, angle looking at Exactly. It. So I, I tried to make the, the, beginner gu- the beginner's guide as, um, user friendly as possible and to show it from as many different angles as possible mm. and to really think the other thing i thought about is um often the, the videos people were producing uh they're throwing and narrating at the same time if you're uh, throwing you know and having a conversation with someone fine but it, it's obviously quite a difficult thing to to throw and talk Do you know what i yeah. mean you're because you, your your focus is split so the way i did it is i i took uh, i filmed a ton of footage and then i edited it a video together and then I narrated it so that way I could give focus to both parts and I feel like that really helps me explain the process verbally mm-hmm. and that's a hard thing to do you know explaining pan positions and, 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 and ways of moving your arms and controlling your muscles um, and I've had people who've messaged me who are blind go thanks your throwing videos are really helpful um, you explain the process really well uh, wow and I feel like I'm throwing some okay pots now. And I was like, what? But I think I wouldn't be able to do that if I was throwing, you know, throwing and talking at the same time. I feel like I would be slightly disconnected. So um, that's how that series came about. That's um, awesome. <laughs> that's unbelievable. Uh, you had little blind people. <laughs> I, was, I was so shocked. I was like, what? <laughs> um, <laughs> this is cool. <laughs> yeah, you know, but good on them for having a go. I'm a mate. I know they... I could. I don't know if I would try and do that. So yeah. I'm amazed that they they are. That's unbelievable. It's interesting you say about the focus split. You strike me as someone who's a hundred percent on a task at any given time. Like 
what, how do you split up the, all the things you've got going on? You know, because it, it's so easy for people to be like, and take ceramics for, oh, I'm going to do this and I'll, I'll video it at the same time so I can post that to six different places or seven different places and then, yeah. or I can do a wee tutorial with it or loads of, and again, it goes back to the importance of and how big social media has become. Like, all of this stuff seems to be like, what can I add on to mm-hmm. make it easy for me in the time? But it seems like everything you're doing, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like, no, that's 100% that time to do that part, you know, five hours to do 26 minutes of audio. Like, that's 100% that time. This is 100% throwing time. This is 100% mm-hmm. filmmaking time. You're not trying to mash it all up. I think I probably am. Um... I, I, I uh, again, I think maybe the perception that people get online is slightly different from reality. Mm. Like my camera sits on its tripod all the time. If I'm, you know, making, I'll film. But the way I, I try and do it is um, if I'm, you know, because I film every single process because I'm making these videos that span um, the throwing, the trimming, the glazing, the firing, the unpacking, the kiln, and then like the sanding of the work. So I try and film every single step all the time. So the film, the camera is always pretty much rolling, but um, I'm quite focused in terms of uh, I'll throw for, I'll, I'll film for like the first hour of the day, and then I'll just smash out the rest of the pots after that right. off camera while listening to an audiobook. Right. Um, but no, I, I I don't know. I'm quite a focused person. I think I get a bit again. I think it's why for social media I've been so obsessed. I think I get I I do get very obsessed about things. Yeah. Um, and that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but no, it, 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 nowadays it is often very, it's not, I think people also think I produce a lot more work than I actually do. Um, I don't produce thousands of spots a year. I probably produce like a thousand or, you know, 1.5 max. Um, and then I'll go home early and I'll do some YouTube work or make some videos or mm. I'll come in early to do some throwing. And then I'll, you know, my work, my day is totally random. And the, the book that I wrote last year through another spanner in the works and kind of ruined everything because now I had to do another, th- you know, another thing. Oh, so, I had, so I had to do, you know, three days a week at home writing, two days here, or vice versa. Um, the truth is, I probably don't have a very good work-life balance. Yep, it's managing your time is difficult. Yeah, it's really hard. I don't always get it right. I, I, I wish sometimes that I had more free time. Um, oh, <laughs> I've definitely, since, since finishing the book, I feel like I've gained some time back. But then there are other things then, you know, like you all, <laughs> I, I, yeah, all, all the PR that's coming with the launch, right? So press, right, all, all this crazy stuff, that becomes a whole other facet that now I'm focused on. Mm. And again, because I'm not a particularly extra person, I find stuff like that tricky. Uh, I get very stressed about it. And I, I get, yeah, anyway, so yeah. that's life. But, um, but you say you don't have a, a good work-life balance or you say, you know, that you don't think you've got it right. Like, mm what is right and more importantly what is right to you because it's very well and good being like reading the the online definition of you should only work these hours and you yeah. should yes but like ultimately are you happy well you know that's actually a really good question um and one that me and my partner discuss a lot because um what is a normal work-life balance and i would maybe i'm probably have the unpopular opinion but i'm happy working working is what fulfills me some people in the world are fulfilled by traveling and seeing the world which i still love but um i love i just love making pots i love working and i maybe that won't last forever but um that's what fulfills me um in the same and that's okay that's so that's what i you know it's normal not everyone has to have the same work life you know has to go on holiday x amount of times a year um there's no one way of living and, yeah. and, and I'm totally happy to do it. My, you know, um, this makes me sound probably like I don't go on holiday. I really love going, yeah. going on holiday, but I'm also very happy just to make and then go on a walk with my dog and yeah. then... That is your break. The that's day. my break. Yeah. I, 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 I don't need crazy stimulus of travelling and, and experiences and, and all this kind of thing. I'm content. That's, that's, that's it, content. content yeah. Yeah. But if you're content, you know, to Kate's point of that's okay, like... Who is anybody else to tell you that that's not a good work-life balance or you're working too yeah. much or you're doing that? Because ultimately work work comes with a bit of a negative connotation at the moment, doesn't mm-hmm. it? Like, yeah, oh, you sure. work too much, but like... Yeah, but say, I'm enjoying it. Yeah, say you were so, I mean, yeah, exactly. gardening, like, and, or you garden too much, or, or like, 
Like, what is too much? And who are you to tell me what it is too much? I think much? the difference is when you're doing something you love. Yeah. Um, I've got lots of friends who obviously, maybe they're not doing the job they love, right? They, they, they fell into a line or an industry that they're doing. Of course, they'd maybe like to be doing something else or something more or, you know, but um, it's very rare actually that people um, do what they absolutely love for a living and can make it work financially. Um, so I'm, I'm very lucky, I, well, I do think I'm lucky because I don't know many people of my, of my friend group who are doing that. Um, but if you're doing what you love, then yeah, by all means do it and do it as much as you want. Um, but no, I, 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 yeah, I'm just, you know, but then again, it's being self-employed, right? So you have the constant fear of, if I stop, is it all going to implode? Yeah. Maybe it will. Um, and I think that's... And you're the only person that can stop and that I'm implosion. the only, exactly. It's, it, and I'm the only one who can do it. Do you know what I mean? In, in my business, there's no one else who I can get in to come and sort everything out. It's 100% reliant on me. So there is this fear because I, I don't have safety nets well, not the people in, in jobs have safety nets, but at least they have a, a regular income. Yeah. Um, Your income for that month is directly proportionate, not just to you showing up, but to you producing going work. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting you say that you, you feel lucky. I think I've got a different... Yeah, you always <laughs> say that. The, the, the more people I speak to, I think I might be the one, I don't know if I'm right or wrong, with a different outlook on luck. Do you think you're lucky though? Because what I'm hearing so is you've worked very hard. So this hard is another you. interesting topic. So I feel like I am partly lucky, but I've also, I've, so I've met people and I've had people say things to me like, you're so lucky, you know, you started posting on social media at the perfect time in your career, just it was so easy. Mm. And I'm like, well, you know, how many hours do you spend a week producing content to put online to promote your business? And they're like, oh, you know, maybe one or two. I'm like, okay, I do it maybe like 10 or 12 hours a week. Yeah. And I've done that since 2014. Um, it's not luck. It's hard work. And I think, and yeah. You get what of, you put into But, but there, I think there is, there are some things that are, I mean, minutely lucky. I did start, Instagram was easier back in the day. It, it just genuinely was easier to gain followers. It was easier to gain traction. There was less competition. So maybe the time I started was a, a good time to start. But I also worked like a maniac. And I have never stopped. I've never, you know, I haven't stopped. So, um, I agree with you in, in many ways. Yes. Um, you do make your own. I mean, lucky things happen. And of course, you have, con you know, connections exist. You might have someone in your family who has some kind of, you know, introduces you to somebody who gives you some kind of uh, step up. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes mm. can be. Yeah. That's ki that kind of is lucky. But then everybody has, well, maybe not everyone has that. In fact, probably most people don't have that. But I think what's, I think for me, the, the Best and I, again, I don't know if I'm right or wrong. Yeah. Um, I hope that I'm right. <laughs> um, but like, there is lucky moments. Yes. But there is not lucky situations. Like, you're not lucky. A few things have happened that have turned out to be lucky, but at the time you didn't know they were going to be lucky. It wasn't yeah. a moment of luck. It just hindsight, retrospectively, that could have went both ways. Yeah. I think whenever I actually tell people how much I worked, because. <laughs> I mean, this is an interesting topic. Um, that's kind of hard to talk about. Uh, so we don't need to talk about anything you don't want to talk no, about. No, because well, it's, it's interesting. So, I mean, even in the past, before social media, if you didn't actively promote your business, you're not going to be seen, right? So there's always been some form of, you have to go out there. Um, you know, I've, I, I've spoken to potters who, you know, Back in the day, they would drive around the country visiting fairs and shows mm -hmm. and galleries. And they would take their work with them and they would go like, look, do you want to stock some of my work? What do you think? Do you like it? Um, the people who were successful were still going out and doing something to promote their business. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't do that, who's going to find you? So, I mean, there's, people were still expending the same amount of time and effort to, to do things and create their luck. Yep. Create their luck. You know what I'm, you know, yeah. so... It's not like it's a new thing either. Yeah. Um, anyway. Do you know one of the one now. of the most blatantly obvious examples of that was Paul Hamler at Hamler Tools. Mm. So he makes tiny little miniature tools. Wow. Um, oh, beautiful. Check check him out. 
he's phenomenal. Very small Instagram yeah. following. He's eight years old now. Wow. And we did our first podcast with him in America, and he was just first like, ever pod. First time he's talked to anyone about his business. Seriously, yeah. oh, unbelievable. He's been okay, doing this since forty I'll, years after leaving NASA. Yeah. Wow. Crazy. Unbelievable. Okay, I'll listen to that this afternoon. Yeah. And um, he showed us this briefcase that he hmm. made that had all these little miniatures in, and he'd done exactly that. He used to drive around the country and go to shows and show mm-hmm. people his miniatures. Yeah, he sold that's how, his briefcase and yeah, move and things. That's how he had so to show people. Yeah. And it's uh, the social media thing, like, it's there, and like mm-hmm. you say, that is just the new version of walking Doing around and showing things. everyone your stuff. Yeah, but it, I mean, arguably, it, it, it is easier because you're not having to, you know, financially, you don't have to, it's, it, Instagram is free. It's just time you're investing. So it's, you know, it, it's, it's an incredibly powerful free tool. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you count your time as free, yep. um, uh, that nothing, and nothing else has existed, ever existed like it. So it's, it's, it's this very interesting new thing, but thank God, because many of us who have become well-known or uh, are, are simply able to make a living probably wouldn't- Be here without it. Exactly, so. Like the time no. that you would have to take away from the wheel or traveling to do that. Yeah. And to do that on a much smaller scale, and to do it much more locally. Yeah, well, exactly. Everything now is so global, mm-hmm. which is um, brilliant, yeah. scary. Um, but as a, for a craftsperson, it's you know being having being having being able to have such a global reach so easily is just crazy. Yeah, it's it's. I still find it bizarre. Even the book, like, I find it crazy that someone in New Zealand's reading it. It's like, yeah, it's like so from, cool. From a maker who's pe- featured in the book, it's just like that was my other way of trying to share stories that's mm. offline. Because when you pick up a book, you're you're disconnected with everything else. Like, yeah, you're and reading. more in depth. Exactly. Yeah. So much more in depth. There's other ways than just the internet. But yeah, exactly. These can be But hard. if that's still your way of being found, yes, then that's you know the one that got me is when the. Taiwanese company wanted to stock it. Oh, cool. a, a bookshop in Taiwan wanted to stock it. I'm like, this this would not happen. <laughs> this just this is is madness. But anyway. Where did they find you? On online or probably social enough? media, yeah. Yeah. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah. It's yeah, it's great. You've you've mess- you've mentioned it's a bit of a message there. You've mentioned a number of times like obsession. Mm-hmm. Like how do you frame obsession? Because I'm, I'm very well aware that a lot of us use the word obsession. Maybe not to the dictionary standard of what obsession is. And again, it's another thing that comes with a negative connotation that mm. I'm not sure. At this stage of my life, I'm not sure it is a negative. I mean, I may say something different if we have this same conversation in 20, 30, 40 <laughs> years. I may be like, I was obsessed. But like, And I think it's important for other people to understand and again, only my view, I'd be interested to hear your view on it, that obsession in certain areas is okay. Mm, maybe I used the wrong word. Maybe being passionate is the same difference. Do you know what I mean? I'm just yeah. very passionate about things. And I think I, maybe I'm just picking up on the fact that people have used that passion and used it against me and used the word obsessive, which is then I've clung to, when really it's just I'm very passionate about something. Yeah. Um, because no, there's absolutely nothing wrong. If you do, you know, if you're doing something you like, I mean, there can be unhealthy instances of being obsessive, of course. But if you're doing something that's good and fulfills you and makes you happy, yeah. and obviously isn't detrimental to your health or other people's health, then yeah, yeah, that's how I look at it. it. Maybe, I, I, think, maybe yeah. I am using the wrong word. I think I don't know if you are, um, and if you are, I think all of us are probably using the wrong word because mm. obsession comes up all the time and. It's directly correlated to the quality of the, and I, and I specifically say the quality of the work, and I specifically do not say the success of the maker. Okay. Like obsession is directly correlated to the quality of the work that comes out of someone's shop, and I think obsession is okay, and I think obsession, and again, only my opinions, um, is it's totally fine, especially if it's led by passion, mm-hmm. as long as yeah. it's not led by anything else maybe on towards that's affecting you in other ways yeah yeah but yeah I, I don't know I'm, I'm still waiting for someone to tell me the answer on that no I agree I mean my, my dad's a craftsperson um he makes wooden spoons and wooden sculpture oh, cool. um, and all kinds of things but he is very definitely obsessed right um in the same way I'm obsessed you know it's the same thing um and it's healthy yeah does much of your crafting come from your family come from your dad and stuff um 
I mean, I come from a very artistic family. So right. my mother was a photographer, well, was and still is a photographer. Um, and she is now also a gardener. Um, my dad worked in the advertising industry for 40 years. Um, he was an art director at BBH and Mother and I think lots of places. Um, and, you know, my auntie does stained glass. My uncle's a fine artist with... Wow. Um, wow. He does like paintings and also uh, like three-dimensional reliefs. And they do like collaborative stained glass of his drawings. They're beautiful. Mm. Yeah, sure. Um, that'd be cool. <laughs> they're, 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 his, his, I, I always, yeah, his, there's, their work together is... Match made in heaven. It's so cool. Um, but yeah, and then, and then I've got other uh, photographer, uh, family members who are photographers. Um, all kinds of things. So I, I don't know how direct the influence has been. They definitely encourage me. Uh, you know, at no point did I, you know, I said to my dad, you know, I want to be a potter. He didn't go like, God, what are you thinking? He was like, yeah. if I had a son, that's the, the best thing they could ever say to me. Cool. It literally was his reaction. He was like, that's the perfect thing for my son to be. Um, and then, I don't know, I, maybe to some degree I've inherited their eye. They've always been very good mm. at the objects they live with. And I grew up with lots of craft and art and, and ceramics. Just like passively surrounded Just by every, nice stuff. Yeah, I mean, our house in Norfolk was full of pots. My dad collected all these angular black and white things, um, var beautiful vases. And, and I don't know how much of that's rubbed off on me. It's very interesting. I mean, uh, it's influence, right? Mm. And I, I sent you an email saying, like, I don't want to answer the what are your influences question. Yeah. Because it does drive me nuts because we are, everyone is in, influenced by everything around them. That's exactly my opinion. Um, yeah. You're like, I don't need to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 you know, it's, um, I have no idea. I have no idea um, the impact they've had. I think it will be great, but how do you unpack it properly? Yeah, how do you put a number on that? And yeah. do you have to put a number on that? No, I'm, I think I'm, 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 I'm fortunate to grow up with a family who are all artistic and all appreciate the arts. Mm. So I know, you know, people don't necessarily grow up with that. Mm. Um, but I think the arts is a, a very, very important. Yeah. So, oh yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah. So, we've obviously talked loads. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a good few other notes. No. Go. And I want to. There's a few things I want to go over as well. But first off, I want to give a lot of space to your book. Yeah. Because in a lot of maker spaces, that's unheard. Well, actually. Yeah, yeah, I think you're the first one that I've... Really? Yeah, um, of, of our generation of okay. makers. I know there's some um, some of the older generation that have done books and done mm -hmm. bits and bobs, but certainly of our generation, and I would say from the 40s, there's yeah. a few makers that haven't known you're doing a book. I'm thinking, like, I need to convince these guys to do books because mm -hmm. I know their story and they're phenomenal. Um but yeah, a book. That's no mean feat. Like, book yeah, is one of <laughs> one of no mean like no, I Kate mean collaborates together and, and creates a book. But to put all of this on paper down here. I mean, it's interesting, right? The God, where to start? <laughs> um. Well, to begin with, craftspeople. You know, if 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 they've de dedicated their life to a craft, they're probably going to have an interesting story to tell. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you. I think more people should, you know, I love reading stories about how people fell into a craft, how they trained, what shaped their journey, You're how like they learned. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's really interesting. You know, I don't just care about the, 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 basically during COVID, I was approached by an, my, an, an agent. He just said, um, God, I should go, probably go back a bit further just to, on Instagram every day, um, along with a, a picture or a photo, I write quite a long caption. Mm -hmm. And I, I used to write, basically, uh, I used to try and hit the limit every day, which is 2,200 2, characters, right? Mm -hmm. And it would be uh, my ideas on the craft. It would be what I'm doing that day. It could be anything, anything craft related, my thoughts, right, on paper. But 2,200 characters is kind of limiting because by, by the time you've, you're getting into an idea, really getting into an idea, you've got to wrap it up. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I've been doing that since 2014. And then um, I think in 20, I can't remember if it was 2020 or 2019, I should know this. Um, and it, an agent got in touch with me. He was like, you know, have you ever thought about doing a book? And I was just, I just really got this place up and running. And I thought I would love to, but my focus at the time, I, I, you know, I need to make pots. I, I want to just make, I'd, be, I'd made pots seriously for a, you know, almost two years. So I just wanted to make. Um, 
And he said, okay, well, look, I'm here if you ever need. Mm. Um, and then a year later, um, a publishing director at Penguin got in touch. And I just remember thinking like, shit, I really need to do this. That's a good opportunity. It's a good, no, how many times does somebody from a publishing house that big get in touch with you to do something? So I just rang up my agent and was like, well, I didn't, he was my agent. I just rang up and like, do you want to be my agent? And, um, yeah. uh, and then, yeah, we spent the next um, year and a bit writing. And I, I mean, I overwrote massively. Um, I did something like 150,000 words and our limit was 100. So we had to do, I mean, the, the original, the original book is very different from what's out now. It's kind of a bit more personal, but maybe also a bit more indulgent in kind of craft Mm. And different. It basically there's just more to it. That sounds like the book I'd rather read. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one day unabridged. Uh, but no. And then yeah, it, it was. Um, I guess it's kind of weird because my other. We met with a bunch of publishers, and I was very clear that I did not want to write a how-to book. Yeah. Because I just don't feel you know there are potters who have written how-to books who have forty or fifty years experience. Mm. Of course, I have my approach to making. But I, d I just, I had no interest in writing a how-to book. You know, this is how to make a bowl. This is a mug, teapot. I felt like it'd be more interesting to tell a story of somebody falling in love with the craft and then how they then learnt it. You know, their teachers, the relationships between master and apprentice. And then I also write about kind of the important events during that period. So milestones um, and then how important, you know, some pots were to my education. Mm -hmm. So pots I honed my skills on. Okay. And I break those shapes down. I talk about why different parts of them are important. And then I kind of reflect on how that might have inspired me or to, 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 you know, how that's not inspired, how that's just pushed me down the route I have. So it's, it's kind of weird to write a memoir at 30 because it is basically, it yeah. is a, a memoir of my education. But the, the book is purely that. It's, it's my education. It's not past, um, you know, it's not about the last... Um, couple of years where I've been making and, and working and doing my own style. It's about how I found that style. And I think that's really important. You know, when you're learning to make anything, any craftsperson, you, you have no idea about the, um, the style you want to produce, right? You take in all this information and you, you have to find the style or aesthetic that truly speaks to you. And then you channel yourself into that and you make that. But how do you find what that is? So I hope the book gives people that experience um and uh you know yeah also you know i'm, I'm gonna get older and I, I felt like i should write this story while i'm still young and i can remember everything yes. um before i get old and i can't so it's been really fun it's been really hard yeah. um i've written about things which i've never shared online it is very personal um about my life it's you know about my teenage years about things that i went through about um, teachers, um, it's about everything. It's, 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 and it's, so yeah, it's, it's basically 400 pages. It's long. Um, and there's 150 images. So, cause I've taken photos quite diligently of that time. And cause yeah. my mother was a photographer who kept lovely pictures from my childhood and my teenage years. It's really, there are beautiful pictures throughout it. Um, but it's going to be heavy. It's a tome. I mean, you know, it's, it's like, it's, it's not a coffee table book at all. It's like a memoir, novel, and coffee table because of the because of the images involved. But yeah. it's it's there's not much out like it. I don't think. Um, I can't think of anything now that you're explaining that as to anything like it. Like there's the biography side of things, yeah. which it sounds like it's got tones of biography yeah, in it, yeah, but it, it certainly also has tones of not how to, but the how to how to, yeah. like the things you done. To, to gain the how to Yeah, and then there's also like then a few um, historical sections. So I, I put things in context. So obviously Ken, who I work for, and the style of pots he makes. Mm -hmm. I might do a little a tiny like page explanation about um, the history of Ora Bay glaze or Shino glaze. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I wanted it to be a book that appealed to everybody, yep. not just potters. That was also my other goal. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. technical, but it's not... Um, to the point where you're like, oh my bloody hell, what's all this what's glaze for me? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's easy reading. Mm -hmm. It's not overly scientific. It's personal. It's introspective. And it's uh, hopefully inspiring. I mean, but I mean, who knows? Only a few people have read it so far. So Are you excited? Or are you quite? I'm really excited. Yeah. I'm really nervous. Mm -hmm. 
Because no one's read about this before, about mm, you. Well, yeah, the people who've read it have only said nice things, but they're people who would only say nice things anyway, right? Like yeah. my family and a few, like the people I got to do the, um, so uh, Nigel Slater, who's written the uh, review on the cover, mm -hmm. and uh, Seth Rogen, funnily enough, you know, both of the things they said have been very nice. As in the Seth Rogen. As in the Seth Rogen. <laughs> cool. um, name drop. Um, <laughs> They've both said, you know, really positive things about it, but they're coming from a place where that's their job to, you know, they're not going to give me a blurb, which is, you know, this was crap. You know, yeah, one yeah, star. yeah, um, you know what you're saying, you've not had the... I've not had the general... It just dropping through someone's yeah. mailbox and then being... But, that, yeah. <laughs> but that's what, sure, you know, the editing great. process was like. Yeah. You know, my editor's job was to take 150,000 words, love, which was probably not very good or incoherent or just unnecessary and to get rid of it. So... Yeah, he, he, he likened it to, to making a pot. And I, th I think it is kind of similar. You know, you just start off with this thrown shape and then it's refined, glazed, and then finally it's put in a kiln and you end up with this this thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think actually I've got some... I can get up and... Can I... Where are Let's they? see if you've got some. I don't actually have the book, but I can... Because you're here, I can give you a sneak... A sneak peek. I mean, it's... Totally not allowed to be seen by anyone, but um, <laughs> it, it's like some of the pictures and some of um, it's like sample text for things. But um, like it's like a um, pitch deck for your book, exactly, isn't it? exactly. Um, but no, I mean it's been a really good experience because uh, not often do I stop and think about the ways I was taught and how that impacted my life and how that's impacted my work. I do, I've just been soldiering on and making and making and making. So it's, it's not, it was, it was brilliant to have this, you know, year break. Mm -hmm. wasn't a break. I was still in here two or three days a week. Um, to do that and to, to think really thoroughly about my education and different ways of being taught ceramics. Because there's no, you know, ceramics is this vast craft. Mm -hmm. There's no one way of doing it. Yeah. Every single person you throw is, uses different parts of their hand, different tools. Right. So what what is right? What works? And how do you unpack all of that and, 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 and you know, work that in, into your style and make something that's truly unique? So that's basically what the book's about, I hope. Amazing. Um, very proud. You should be very proud. <laughs> Are you going to take a minute to stop once it's out there? Take a minute no. to... No. Well, I, 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 I wish I could. Um, I think you should. I know, but then there's all like this, the press events, right? I, which I'm way nervous about. There's going to be Florian Gadsby by my hands live, like a little book tour, which is so out of my comfort zone. I can't even begin to explain that, but I'll just, I'll do it, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, but you do understand that nobody knows Florian Gadsby by my hands better than you. No, of course. Yeah. <laughs> like, and, and I just totally get it. Just yourself. Like yes. Yeah, I think we find, I, again, I just, it comes down to the fact that... Uh, I'm just like some random guy in a shed making pots. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, it, to going on tour and talking about that journey for me feels kind of bizarre because I've lived it and I've never known anything else. So I kind of feel like, God, is anyone going to care? Is anyone, you know, people going to come to that to these events? But but you know, there's like a, a world of people who wish they were a random guy in a shed making pots <laughs> yeah. because they are sat in front of a screen or a call center yeah. or a. Like, That's true. And, and, I, and I don't mean, I don't want to paint this picture of this is idyllic, it's all easy going and it's just the right thing to do mm -hmm. because I, I totally understand how we've been there. We've yeah. been the makers and that's why we're doing this. I understand how difficult this is. It's all on your shoulders. Yeah. But like, I really don't want to make, like, polish over it as if it's all, it's all fantastic, it's all brilliant because I understand every... Uh, not every, but I understand the aspects of the difficult, difficultness of it. Mm. But like, there's so many people that wish they had, personally, I believe, wish they had the bravery to do exactly what you've done. Well, it's thank you. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know how to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's rare. Yeah, I don't know. It's real. It's rare, maybe. Um, it's definitely real. So anyway, yeah, I hope, I hope people come, <laughs> but we'll see. Um, oh, I'm sure they will. I am positive. And what was the process like writing a book? Like for other makers, would you recommend it? Was it? Did you find it quite cathartic? Like it was what? really cathartic. I think I was I was quite well practiced. I, I wrote really fast. Um, I was doing like five thousand words a day for a long time. Wow. I was. My idea was I would just smash out 
the story mm-hmm. okay um and talk about the pots i wanted to and talk about the processes i wanted to and the, the important lessons i learned mm-hmm. right and then it was just a, a crazy process of refinement um but i really enjoyed it i really enjoy writing i really enjoy the process of figuring out how to explain a process in a very understandable easy way and to make it written interestingly like for instance i think i'm a much better writer than i am a speaker nice. my 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 actual vocabulary when i speak i think is is relatively limited and i do things like i say you know quite a lot if you if you listen to this and you, you you'll probably you might and it drives me mad but when i write i feel like i can i take my time and i i construct the sentences in a different way and i really think about how it sounds how the sentences sound how the different word you know all this stuff there you go um so i i adored the process there were times where it was really hard and i just did not want to do it but that's it you know mm. yeah um how did you get through the days that you didn't want to do it just made, made pots just yeah. stop writing just, just and, stop yeah, yeah. stop and come or, back. Or, or i would go back and edit stuff i had already written yeah do you know that you saying that there and previously when you said about, you know, your days can be everywhere is totally not what I expected. <laughs> yeah, I just, I had it in my head that it was just like structure, structure, structure. Like, I, and I don't know why. I, I absolutely, I don't know why. Just, I think when you see someone that has amassed such a robust, robust body of work mm. and is so consistent, you think... And I'm bad for it as well. Like I think, like I need to be more structured. I need to be like time box and everything. What is the insert current yeah. fashionable? See, my way might just be alright. Uh, you know, <laughs> right, you know, right, yeah. But you know what? I, I I I try and model my whole life around not being like that. Really? I I can't stand actively try. I I can't stand having lists telling me what to do. Telling you. I can't stand <laughs> having like everything planned in my diary. Um, I can't stand having like lists of pots that I have to make. So my, my ideal life, and I'm, again, I'm very lucky that I've been able to do this, is I can come in in the morning and I can go, what do I feel like making today? Teapots. Let's make teapots. Um, because I don't rely on galleries typically to sell my work. Um, you know, I work, I release my, my pots three or four times a year. I make whatever I want to make for those updates. I know what's popular, so of course I'm going to make them, but I'm not killing myself making thousands of mugs just to satisfy demand. I make what makes me happy. And I do not want to have a life as a craftsperson as dictated by external fact. You know, I want to make what make yeah, what fulfills me. Because um, if you go away from that, then... I feel like I would lose my passion. Yeah. And that's why, like, I, you know, I've had times in my life where I've had... You know, Lisa would say, okay, you need to make mugs, then espresso cups, and then we need to do creamers, and then beakers and jugs. And I'd have this list, and it wouldn't be tons of pots, but it could be, and I'd just think, oh, fuck, you know, Jesus. Um, but, and, you know, I understand that um, that has to be done. And I still do do that now, I guess, but I'm, it's all in my own capacity. Yeah. I never work more than I necessarily have to, and it's... it's You're the boss, and you choose what you I'm the boss. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm the boss, but, <laughs> yeah, I... I my and for instance, this shop update I'm doing on Sunday, right? I see you, hey buddy. Little boy. You just want to um, <laughs> I haven't. I know. I decided I was going to do that last week. It hasn't been in the calendar all year. I just decided, like, okay, now it's time. <laughs> um, but yeah. So, you, so you didn't. You don't have like these are the dates I'm going to drop. It's just a case. I of... know roughly when I should do it. Yeah. But I, I don't. Again, I don't want to have. And that's why I think part of the book, the book has been challenging in a way because obviously I've had all these new deadlines that I have to conform to because it has to be ready for it to go to, to, go to print yeah. and all these things. Yeah, no, that's it. Um, you, have, you actually have deadlines. What's this? What's this <laughs> yeah. He might want to go out, but I don't know whether I should. Yeah, bro, if, hey, if you want to let the dog out, by all means, let the dog yeah. out. Yeah, no, yeah of course. course. We can pick yeah. back it might up. Be, it might be worth doing. So cool. Yeah, I don't know. There's something about metal that I just... It's sharp and angular and and... and I think if you look at my work, like it's, it is quite. Mm-hmm. The glazes are quite fluid and soft, but the actual clay work underneath is very sharp and precise. Yeah. And sometimes I look at metal work, I'm like, oh god, I would love to just be able to like leave like beautiful. There's a guy, a Japanese artist I love called Jiro Nagasi. Do you know him? No. Um, just makes stuff out of aluminium, so he's super limited. But his his his, I just it makes me um. Yeah. Gives you all the warm fuzzy feelings about making. I just want to make it so much. Yeah. Um, so I think I, generally these days I look at metalwork for inspiration more than I look at other for other ceramics. That's interesting. 
I'd feel um, like, I think it might be quite easy to get bogged down looking at ceramic after ceramic after yeah, ceramic. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, he does... Oh, wow. Um, that's a very nice chair. <laughs> yeah, his chair, you know, the chairs are beautiful. Um, oh, wow. And I've, I've been trying to buy his stuff for years, but it's really hard. Anyway, I, bought, I finally people got... People say that, but you're right. <laughs> yeah. We've had multiple texts to people that know really? are coming here saying, can you pick me up a mug? I'm like, no, do the drop. <laughs> Do it like everybody else. Yeah. But um, yeah, I finally got, uh, the, the only thing I could, was able to get was a bookend. So I've got a bookend like, you know, the, um, I can show you, but it's, it's so good. I nice. had to carry it back and through customs and I was like, they're going to fucking stop. It's like a huge chunk of aluminium. Yeah. And I wanted to carry in my carry-on luggage because it was expensive. Yeah, you and, don't want to get a missing. We went through security and my thing got beeped and my bag got hauled off and I was like, oh, fuck, it's the Giro Nagasi. But um. It was. It was my toothpaste. <laughs> so I was. I was. I was so, so happy. Funny. That's good. I mean, it's it's so simple. Yeah. It's so simple, but it's just. Um, oh, nice. You know, two cut out pieces. They slot together really nicely, but they make such cool looking. I thought, yeah, that sharp edge is never going to get through customs because no. it's it's really sharp. Anyway. Um, but you got one, and you got. I it got back. it. It's my most. I love it more than anything else I own at the moment. So um, that's good, and it's a bookend. <laughs> I, mean. I love how like these items mean so much. Yeah, from like mm. even from a different maker, like that's you know you've been wanting that for such a long time and you've got it and it just takes pride of place in your house. Yeah, the, the funny thing is I, I wouldn't care what it was of his yeah. as long as I own something from his catalogue of work. I am happy. So that goes back to that thing of you're buying the maker. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know you follow their work for years. Mm -hmm. You see where they've gone, the work they've created. So it's just owning something that's come from their hands. Yeah. How do you feel about other potter's work? Because pottery's so hands-on. You know, there's, it's very clear that the ribs in this mm. are the ribs by those thumbs sat across the table from me. How do you feel, you know, there must be certainly other potters, maybe the ones that you've worked with, yeah. that's just like, wow. Yeah, I mean, I'm like anything, I'm always looking at other potters' work and thinking it's better than mine. Or oh, there are potters I aspire to whose work, uh, oh, I just, you know, I can't imagine how they do it and I'm in awe and I wish my work was more like theirs. But then there's no point just changing what I make to mimic someone else's at this point. Mm. Um, you, you do sort of have to cultivate your own style and, and let it grow and change. And that's why, like, some of these metal, there are some, they kind of look a bit brown. Mm. But these pieces, they're a way of me trying to recycle pots I would have otherwise thrown away. Oh, okay. Um, and it's, this is me leaning into my metal, um, oh, <laughs> my metal vibe, right? So me liking metal and using just excessive amounts of iron. Oh, look at that. To create oh, wow. surfaces that are totally, they're impractical. You know, they're not necessarily food safe, but they are just, for me, beautiful objects. Um, like that, these two, these two are, are like the ideal inter internal surface see i quite like this one yeah so they're all different but that's yeah. the i can't you know i can never replicate it um so this is a, you know a slight uh divergence but it's still using the basis of my normal work and is this just experimentation time that you put aside it's, it's just dead easy these are these so these are pots that were seconds yeah. so the, well they know that it's it is dead easy yeah the, the glazes there were like slight defects in the surface but the forms were nice so i thought well i don't want to just like venom yeah, or sell them as seconds. So I just coat iron on and I refire them. Um, it's highly impractical. You know, firing things a lot of times means they are inherently weaker objects. Right. Okay. Um, but all it is is yellow iron okra. It's the same stuff you can see on those shelves. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then I just refire them. And it's a way of giving, you know, pots a second breath of life that I would otherwise not deem firsts, yep. you know. And... Um, they're different and it allows me to lean into that inspiration of metalwork that I like while still making pots. Um, yeah. Nice. Anyway, that's them. That's, that's a, a wee little... They're kind of silly little things, but they're just... They're, they're, in, they're interesting, things. aren't they? Yeah, they they're are far. interesting. Um, so, I don't know. I'm collecting a lot of them at the moment just <laughs> for... Your place. <laughs> no, I don't know. Well, for the exhibition later this year, maybe. Mm. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. So, very quickly, to go back yes. to the book... Will you do another one? Do you think this is something you do every 10 years well, or so? Well, it's interesting because when my um, publisher wrote like one of my blurb things for the book announcement, he, he said Florian Gadsby's first book. Um, it's a safe bet. Uh, a lot of people, my, my stepdad is a author. Okay. Ah. Uh, he writes, he's written tons of children's books and he's done a lot of ghostwriting. Um, he also is a, an amazing gardener, uh, 
builds and fixes bikes, uh, makes his own clothes, uh, but like properly, like his own shirts. Uh, he's another amazing uh, Renaissance man. Um, anyway, uh, I've completely lost my train of thought. I'm, well, you're right. Well, totally yes. So anyway, uh, uh, he's been in that industry for a long time, mm-hmm. and uh, and he's told me the same thing that, that my publishers have told me, and my edit, uh, my and my agent, which is basically nowadays, if you have a big social media following, it's quite easy to get books commissioned, and okay. most of the people they're you know doing books with are people you're, you're way more likely to have a people agree to do a book with you if you have a large following because you can guarantee sales. Right. Whereas if you're somebody who doesn't have a, an online following in, in any capacity whatsoever and you've written a book, it's more of a gamble for the publisher, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, which is a little bit sad thinking about that. That there are, But I guess, again, it's always sort of been like that. They've always had to take gambles on books. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I would like to write something else. Obviously, I can't write about my life anymore because this is sort of almost up to date. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's a good question. Mm. Uh, I have some ideas, but uh, I think it would be more of a historical... Uh, like a pre-folding God's report. It's a good question, though. I don't know. I think it wouldn't be much about me. It would be maybe more philosophical about craft as a whole. Oh, okay. Nice. Or, and then... But do you know what? I, I haven't really thought about it much because I've just done this one. Yeah. Um, but we'll see. Maybe my publisher will have an idea. But I, I also don't want to just be like this person who... I still, I'm, I'm quite adamant to make sure that ceramics is my uh, primary output. So yeah. this will be like for the next couple of years, maybe. And then if I write things and, and maybe something will become apparent that I would like to write about and inspires me. Yeah, you're not um, forcing it to happen. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to force it. I want, I want to want to write about something. Um, yeah. Has that so, been the same throughout, you know, with your craft and stuff? Just don't force things. Just it will happen when it happens. Generally, yeah. I sometimes force new ideas or if I'm really struggling, I'll like spend a week, um, you know, forcing myself to throw bigger or different things. Yeah. But I, I tend not to force things. Yeah. Reach you to what now? <laughs> I think he needs a, need a, a poop. That's all right. <laughs> Couldn't be less of a problem. I was going to leave the door open for you, okay? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't know what he wants. He doesn't know what he wants to do. You're just getting bored, buddy. Um, <laughs> oh, he's dropped his ball under there. I think. Yeah, I think I kicked it. Um, You'll find it. What should we do? I mean, I could just take him up the road so he does go to the loo. Yeah, man, you can do whatever. But then Honestly, that's going to be like be a ten-minute break. Point. Yeah, let's do that then. Don't, you sure? Yeah, there's whatever. Some whatever pressure. your normal day is for him and you, totally fine. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't affect us. It might slightest. be. It might be easier. What, what, should we? I don't remember what we were talking about, but. We'll talk about the book. The, when we come back, we'll just cover release dates for the book and then move on okay. to the next section. Um, that makes sense. Should we just do the releases now and then we can Yeah, let's do that then. Because I think... So oh. when... Yeah, and then we're moving on. Yeah. That makes sense. We're moving yeah. on to another topic. So when is the book being released? Uh, it comes out uh, in the UK, September 14th. Right. Um, and I think there are talks in the work for it to be released in other countries. Cool. Um, but that might be a little later. Um, but I can't give you any concrete information yeah, yet about that. But um, yeah, not long. It's, um, not. it's going to be uh, yeah, a wild, a wild day. But I think I'm going to be doing like a book tour in uh, confirmed. Well, there'll be somewhere in London and there'll be somewhere in uh, Manchester and somewhere in Bristol. Mm-hmm. And all of which I'm going to be announcing, I think, next week on the 5th. So I don't know. Yeah, maybe that'll be in time for this or... Yeah, 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 yeah this will so, go out or we've got one more to go out early next week and yours will go out either late next week or the start of the following week. Great, so I mean, if there's any, um, all the information, I'll, I'll have published it by then, right. um, you know, about the, the tour. It feels very weird doing a tour, I'd say, but yeah, that will all be out by then. Wicked. Cool. Right, let's get you to a wee walk yeah, let's and then we'll come walk. back. We just want to take a quick second to introduce you to the podcast sponsor for this week, Ebis UK. Are you a maker looking to sell your creations across the country or internationally? Shipping can be a complex process, but there is a solution. And Ebis is that solution. Ebis are a specialist art handling and shipping company, and their whole goal is to simplify shipping and provide you, the maker, with complete peace of mind. 
Yeah, Ebus take care of everything from pickup to professional packing and accurate documentation. They handle customs and regulations, so you don't have to. With Ebus, you can trust their experienced team to ensure smooth and secure delivery. They offer tailored solutions and their primary goal is simply to make shipping simple. You can visit ebus.co.uk today and start your stress-free shipping journey with Ebus, your trusted partner in shipping. He like almost likes the fan, but then he sits in front of it and goes like, no! Yeah, just a bit too much. It's too much and too cold. <laughs> Wicked. Comfortable to get back into it? Yeah, very happy to. Young Chiro's walked. Mm. Hmm? You are walked, pal. Yeah, you are. I'm ready for a nap. So we've got a few things that I still want to cover with the very interesting man sat for us. I'm glad, I'm glad you think so. <laughs> um, drops. Why yeah. are drops so popular with potters? Is it a workflow thing? Like, it's not just a constant stock um, of the shop. Yeah, I guess it's the way I've always done it. And the way I think about it is, um, I don't want to, if my work was constantly available, I would have to be constantly spending my weeks making pots, but then also spending hours wrapping and shipping. Mm. So by doing it in, in, as a drop, it, it focuses all that time, which is, you know, it's boring. Wrapping pots isn't, it's not mindless, but it's repetitive and it's painful. I always get, you know, sore hands from bloody folding cardboard and it's I'm actually amazing how much it takes out on your hands. Anyway, uh, I would rather that time be focused in blocks throughout the year rather than doing it all the time. Because it also means that Basically, what I do is I, I build up work for a drop and then I give the studio like a blitz clean and then all my packing material is above us. So then I just chuck all that down. Makes sense. Um, doesn't get dust, you know, no, has no clay dust on it. So it's just, in it, I think as a ceramicist, it's, you know, pots take time to make, mm -hmm. but it's also nicer spending two or three months dedicated making time mm -hmm. than you do a sale. And it also builds hype, right? Uh, it makes people anticipate the drop. They're excited for it. Whereas if it was always available, you know, it's like scarcity. It makes it kind of s scarce. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's why I do it. I think it's just generally it's for myself to have a, a, a more um, pleasurable workflow, basically. Yeah. Um, I know it's frustrating. A lot of people, I mean, it, my, my work is already frustrating to obtain. Yeah. Um, because I am I'm one person doing everything. But also, I you know I'm not a factory producing tens of thousands of pots. I, I, I release maybe 250 to 450 pieces at a time. Right. Um, and then that tends to sell in maybe, um, you know, two to five minutes. I, know, I understand that that's really tricky. Um, and I have thought about like other ways of doing it. So I could have pre-orders, but if I did pre-orders... Then nobody else would get... <laughs> well, the thing is I would still have to set limits on the yeah. objects I would make. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And they would sell out just as quickly because people would go in, they would tap, you know, I want five mugs, submit. It's no different all in delivery time. No, it's and it's and then I would have lists of pots to make, which is exactly what I'm trying to avoid in my life. You just want to make what you want to make, yeah. what yeah. you like to make, and then if people want to buy it, that's yeah. what you buy. <laughs> yeah. And then the other thing is that people have suggested doing like a lottery system. Mm -hmm. So I do a lottery, a certain amount of people are allocated tickets or like the password to the shop that way people who might normally not normally get the chance, um, which I've thought about. The, the, the thing is, uh, it's already so much admin and work for one person that truthfully speaking, I just want it to be what's easiest for me. Absolutely. And it, well, yeah, otherwise, you know, I, if it becomes too much of a headache, I, I already spend an awful lot of time doing everything. So it needs to be just simple and streamlined. And at the moment it's first come first serve, yeah. which is fundamentally, it's fair. I mean, it might not be fair for everybody. I mean. If you've got fast internet, maybe you will. Um, and there are people who figure out like sneaky methods. So there are people who save my URLs um, for specific items. So instead of going straight to the shop, they go straight to certain objects and buy them and do stuff like that. Top tip for anyone listening. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's great. It's great. The, the, the rate it, it sells is crazy. It, it's completely never in a million years did I expect it to be like like that. Do you know? I think the the way that yeah, people say it's not fair and stuff. It's, it's not what you're doing that's unfair. It's the detachment from... It's one man making all this. That's what you... It's the detachment. You not having the detachment, you being the customer, mm. is what makes that unfair. 
Like if, if you understood exactly what goes into it and you watched the stuff that you post every single day showing how hard it is to get ready for mm. ready for a drop, you would understand that it's going to ship out. Like you, you're building the hype. You're, you're doing all that work, aren't you? Yeah, and I, I, people do get frustrated. And the thing is, I, I understand it. Like when there's something you really want and it's released online and you miss out, mm. it's obviously frustrating. Glass to be tickets, right? Same thing. Or it's really, you, and it's very easy to take. So I could quite generally with each update, um, it's a very, very positive experience, but overwhelmingly um, dominated by the negative emails I get. I don't get many, but every shop update, I'll get, you know, five to 10 messages from people who are obviously very hurt. They may be overreacting, but they, you know, they say this whole long, you know, I've been waiting for months. This was for my partner or this is for their wedding anniversary and I didn't get it. And I, I understand that, but I, I can't cater to everyone's no. yeah. needs. Um, so I get that it's frustrating, um, but because it is online, I say to people like, look, you didn't have to leave your house. You didn't have to, you know, you could do this from bed. You can be on your phone in your pajamas. For you, it's annoying to miss out on it, but there will be other opportunities. Yeah. Um, and when you do get something, it'll be even more special. Or maybe people get so annoyed that they never try again. But um, yeah, um, you know, one person, I don't want to scale up my business and hire people and get more kilns and have other people make my pots because I think that will just change the, the work and people won't appreciate it if it's you know, made by somebody else's hands. I mean, my book's called By My Hands now. It kind of has to be, you know, yeah. it's, it it's be special you. because it's made by somebody who you appreciate and yeah. you follow and you may have followed them for like 10 years so yeah. um Do you know it's, it's interesting when we spoke to a few friends in the craft space to say we were coming here a number of them were asking you know can we pick something like <laughs> pre-drop <laughs> and it's not it's obviously not a question that i'm even asking like the drop is the way it is because it has to be yeah. fair and i really one i really respect the way and why you do it that way and I definitely would say to the people that miss out, like the fact that you've missed out is what makes this work so attractive. Yeah, it build, it build, you know, it all yeah. builds. But I, 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 that's also another reason why it's hard sometimes having visitors here because some of the work, like these vases, are designated for a show later this year. But it's very hard when I have a visitor who comes in here and they they don't know obviously what's for sale and what isn't. Yeah. And having to tell someone like, no, that's not for sale. That's not for sale. That's not for sale. Um, and they might go like this, you know, there's a shit ton of work in here. But for instance, most of this stuff on that shelf is old archive work or pieces that I, I don't like, so I don't want to sell them. Really? Yeah. So it's, it, there's, they're there for a reason. Um, this little line of mugs up there, they're up there because the handles, I made a batch where they're all slightly too small, so I don't want to sell them. So uh, there are reasons. So online works because it's, it's my, you know, curated collection that I'm offering out mm. to the world. So... I do occasionally have visitors here and I do occasionally let people go away with one or two pots, but I'm very also, you know, I explain to them, this is the way I sell my work. It's generally online. Um, and I think as soon as people have an explanation, like all the people who do get annoyed with me in emails, I have a very kind response that I reply with. Um, I explain the whole situation. I explain that it's just me, you know, I only produce this much work and 95% of the time people reply and go like, okay, I, I, I totally understand. I'm really sorry I sent you that email. I was just frustrated. So, um, but yeah, I call it damage control. Like whenever I do a shop update, I've got to do X amount of hours just being like, I'm really sorry. Yeah. Um, oh, man. Do you feel you have to justify yourself to those people though? Uh, It'd be very easy. My girlfriend and my mum and lots of people say you don't even bother, but... Um, I, I'm just, I've, I have and, uh, yeah, yeah, you absolutely would, and, and so, I don't think it's wrong too. No, I, I think it depends. Uh, and uh, Also, like, sometimes I get really rude, like, horrible, horrible, horrible emails from people. Always about the shop update. Um, I wish I could show you one, but I actually can't even remember the email address it was sent from. But it, it was, it's hilarious. Um, it, just that or someone gets react. so... <laughs> but yeah, I, and I just, I, I, you know, every gut instinct says don't bother replying Florian, but I just feel like I should just... If you don't, then it'll just annoy you even more. Yeah, for me, that's I don't want to let I don't want to let somebody win by you know I don't I I don't reply to trolls and I don't get many trolls at all mm. because I think there's actually very little to attack in my work, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I'm not making provocative, controversial work. It's it's made with a um, 
to a high level of craftsmanship, I think. Mm -hmm. So there's, I don't think, and it's very, you know, my work's very neutral and simple. So what really, what can you attack? You might not like the work subjectively, uh, you know, their perception of it might not be their style, but there's very little. So I don't get much trolling, but so, yeah, um, it's, uh, but when I do get it, it's quite fun to, 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 to answer back. Although I shouldn't, but yeah. No, but the, the, I, I totally get why. You yeah, answer back. yeah. What about like Instagram and stuff? Do you receive much troll in there, or is that basically all? nothing? That's no, probably good. Um, no, I'm, I'm I don't I don't get much. I block people who've done it in the past, yeah. and there have been some very interesting, high profile potters who have sent me some horrible emails. Um, but in those cases, it's just better to block and move on. Um, because it, uh, you know, people have a perception of you even though they've never met you. Yeah, and they think if you're successful that you're lucky or you you grew up very privileged and you don't need to even you know make a living or sell pots yeah. people don't know the full story and people and, and it's very easy for people to have an assumption of of somebody that they've never met um, yeah. for sure but Fairly. you know it's fine you, yeah. just, you just ignore them those are the people i ignore the people who are who are yeah, yeah i think that's good advice. who i might meet yeah and i might actually interact with in in some kind of social circles but people who are just some funny person from the internet it's quite fun <laughs> <laughs> so how many drops a year do you do um it tends to be i try I aim for three mm -hmm. the book in the last two years has skewed things okay so this year will probably be two the year before was two but three is like a comfortable amount for me um mm -hmm. again i don't push myself to do mm -hmm. a, a certain amount so yeah three three is nice three is good and what makes three a comfortable amount why three it's just, it, it, it's, it means I have, you know, I'm producing work at not a insane level. So it's, I'm, I'm working, but I'm not pushing myself excessively and also leaves me time to make a YouTube video every week. Right. So, um, and now that's, you know, YouTube is, is a pretty good income. So that's, mm -hmm. and I feel like I can actually reach a much, a different audience and I affect them in a different way. Um, other than people just buying my work and, and it's, it's, kind of educational because I don't teach I used to do I used to teach um evening classes when I worked for Lisa Hammond okay um which I loved it was really fun you know I, I had the same students for almost three years and it, it turned into a social function where they would one of them was like Florian is it all right if I bring in you know a bottle of wine next week maybe we can have a drink and I was like okay yeah fine and then you know two years later every week same thing like they, so that was lovely um and I enjoy teaching but I I I I my personal preference is to, to work by myself and, and kind of have a bit more of a solitary um, workflow. I, my ideal situation is just making pots and listening to audiobooks or podcasts, mm -hmm. right? Um, so by making YouTube videos that are more educational, it kind of, um, I can teach without having to necessarily be in a room with somebody. Right, okay. Um, that makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. And you can still do that whilst you're making your pots. Exactly. Like you say that hour or yeah. whatever it is in the morning, a couple yeah. of hours in the morning. So your your workflow when when you've done a drop is it is it like fresh start again or do you make time for experimentation you know what if you're doing a drop and there's an idea in your head do you just do it or is there like a I experiment as I go right um, but yeah I, I, I will also do a bit more experimentation I think after when when I am fresh when the space is cleared out a bit then mm. I, it, it does feel nice to fill the space with new ideas yeah. even if they're only subtle small changes. Um, yeah. It's good to keep it. it yeah, is. keep it going. Just your experimental. Yeah, you've got to you've got to constantly be trying and changing things. Um, Forever learning. Exactly. Yeah, it's one of the big things with makers that I feel some not many but some makers and every maker has the ability to fall into the trap of just becoming a producer. Yeah. Rather than a maker, and I feel like pottery could be one of those that you could really just well, these the... mugs are selling well, so just keep knocking them out. You know. Yeah. I feel it'd be a really easy thing to do if you're not making time for that experience. But then it's, you know, if, if the example I'd like to use is if your favourite rock band, I mean rock band, okay, for my instance, I used to love Muse. Right. I love Muse. I went to their concerts. I used to camp outside, so I got into the Golden Circle. <laughs> but that was like their first three albums, right? And I love those albums. But then they started making music that I didn't particularly like. And now I don't go to concerts. I don't buy their records, Right. I suppose you can look at artists in a similar way if they're producing work that you love. If you were to make a sudden drastic change, mm -hmm. 
then maybe your audience might not appreciate it in the same way, or they'll go, this just isn't Florian Gadsby. Um, mm. So I do think, of course, it's good to experiment and push yourself, but you do need to think about where you've come from and the work you've produced and why that's attracted people. You know, if I start suddenly producing slipwear with colourful squiggles and, and patterns and flowers on it, I think people would be like, what the fuck is this? Why are you making this? I don't like it as much. Yeah, that isn't your audience. It's someone else's audience. So, you know, you are sort of trapped a little bit by your own success and you do need to produce what people like, but I do try and, and push it in certain directions. But it's very simple. The thing is, I, I want to make the pots I want to live with. That's my whole thing. You know, That's what I was going to ask you, yeah. I, I, yeah, I want to make pots that I would live with and use at home. And um, they're simple. You know, they're not overly complicated or decorated. Uh, they tend to be cylindrical, straight-sided, with generally quite uniform surfaces. And there's only so much you can push that idea. Mm -hmm. um, but with mugs, for instance, I know that my cylindrical shape sells very well. But yeah. then I've also been producing these guys, which are more angular mm -hmm. and different. Like these and ones. yeah, so and to the, like to the left, there's some even more you know ridiculous specimens that, <laughs> frankly, I'll never make again. But it's fun. <laughs> it's fun making those batches to then yeah. go. If if you know if something works, it's different. I can go. Okay, I want to start producing more of that. Mm -hmm. Or I just keep those one-off mugs, and then maybe one day I'll make a teapot that matches one of them, and they can be sold as sort of a one-off pair. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, but yeah, I always talk. I always say to to Lisa, we used to have a joke where. Wouldn't it be funny if, if, as a potter, you just you have like a moniker and you start producing completely different work under a completely different name? Like go straight and yeah, a potter. But, but it fulfills a different, you know, sometimes I look at potters who are making slipwear. Um, do, you, have you, do you know slip? Uh, like, yeah, Holly Cooper does slipwear. Yeah. You know, it's interesting what you said there because her, we featured her in edition one and then went back to do a podcast with her because her work had entirely changed. Oh, wow. She okay. realised exactly what you've said. Mm. I'm going to do what suits me, not yeah. what yeah. I think people want. Yeah. I mean, slipwear is inherently popular. It's it's kind of the antithesis for me, at least, of, of like Potter's pottery. You know, very brown, dark clay, lovely white slip. As you're producing the work, the work you cover it in this watery clay, and they, you know, the, the the vessels glisten, and it's all very it's in the moment. And sometimes I do think, like, God, yeah, it'd be really nice to do that. Um, produce work that it just isn't, uh, you know, throw a nice humble jug with a nice big spout and a belly and a good handle. Um, Traditional, I guess, more traditional work. But then, uh, anyway, yeah, I, we, yeah, it's a joke where it'd be funny if you do that, just under a completely different name. Because sometimes I am, ten, you know, I, I, feel, I have days where I'm like, God, I just want to make some like very functional, usable brown pots that are thick and chunky. Yeah. It, it, it's very appealing. But um, just try it. <laughs> yeah, just try it. Do it as a limit. Well, I make it and then I'll use it for myself. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah um, so you still get the making of it out of your system. Yeah, exactly. Have you ever done anything with? And it's going to. <laughs> prove the Luddite that I am in the pot pottery world. You know the, the sort of construction method? They do a lot of teapots in Japan and stuff out of it. Have you ever tried that? You know, I watched some the other day and it's, it's I know very, you like, engineered. You, like, you pat out the bits of That's clay it. and then you construct. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what is that? <laughs> it's hand building. Right, okay. But to an insanely perfect level where they make the pots look as if they could have been thrown on the wheel because oh. they're so symmetrical. Yeah. Um, no, frankly. Yeah. Does uh, it interest you at all? There's other I obviously would, slip stuff. I does. would I love watching the videos. I would collect and use them. I would display them at home. But I don't have any um compunction to make them. That's fair. Um They're just a completely different thing, right? They require a different skill set, which I probably if I tried to make a teapot in that fashion, it would probably be shit. Um right. I don't have that training. So yeah. I would like to have a go at it, but again, it's yeah. It's a whole different thing. It's a whole different it? thing. Yeah. And, um, you know, with pottery, there are so many different routes you can take. There are so many different styles. You can spend your whole life trying everything, but then you'll never maybe find what you truly love. Yeah. It's, I guess, again, I don't know why I keep going back to the musician analogies. If you're a musician trying out dozens and dozens of genres every day, you're recording a song in a different style. You're probably never going to find the one that either resonates with you perfectly or resonates with an audience. So you do need to some degree, spec you know, channel your, your, your style into one or two particular aesthetics. Yeah, I hear that. So how do you decide what goes into a drop? Is it 
Where does that come from? It's just a real mix. I tend to do like uh, a certain amount of, of, of affordable functional stuff like mugs and bowls, mm-hmm. jugs, uh, some plates, things like that. And then I intersperse that with more decorative um, uh, one-off pieces, vases, uh, uh, some of these, for instance, uh, I just try and make a real interesting mix. So it's all, it's not just all mugs or it's not mm. all bowls. It's kind of a whole body of work. Um, and it's always, you know, mugs are always the most popular thing. By far, they sell out in. Uh, <laughs> my last shop, I had 190 mugs. This was the Christmas one, which is the um, bit always my biggest update of the year. Yeah. They all went in 20 seconds. 20 seconds. 20 seconds. Crashed in, isn't it? I know, but it's it, it's it's insa- you know the mug is the I, in the in the book I call it it's the gateway drug to ceramics. It's <laughs> it's often it's the pot that if you're collecting tends to be well. So to begin with, it's it's universally understandable. Everyone has a favorite mug. Yeah, everyone uses a mug. Yep. Um, and then when you're learning pottery, it's often the first shape that you start to make. Yeah. Okay. And then as a collector, it's often the pots like people start their collections with mugs so they'll collect like a whole yeah. range of mugs made by different potters so they are just universally interesting things you know yeah, yeah. what's he after it's i think just, it's just <laughs> after a, a scratch i think is he let Are me after get... your wee ball i think he's lost his ballie <laughs> you lost your ball where is that where is it shiro where is it how will you deal with this on your podcast will you cut or do you I could just cut where it needs to be. Yeah. If it's little dog interruptions, it doesn't matter at all. What's he found? What's Dad found? What's Dad found? What's that? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Drops. Uh, But yeah, just a mix. Just a... a, 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 It's it's what's going on in my head at the time condensed into Mm -hmm. a shop. Do you have to do anything specific, like, internet-wise, for such a big drop that you know is going to... I'd be terrified it just crashed. <laughs> uh, I'd be absolutely terrified. I use no, I just I use Squarespace. Yeah. I, I know they might not be the most um the best service for it, but I've I've built my whole website there and um, We've built just moved our whole website over to it and I'm impressed. Oh really? Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's changed it's, a lot in the last few years, like it's got a it lot has. better. Yeah. But for e commerce they do you know, if, if if something's in your cart, if you add something to your cart it isn't safe for you. So if somebody checks out faster, they get it from you. So I, I do get a lot of people who they put stuff in their cart, but because they check out slowly, um, other stuff, uh, then, yeah, they had stuff in their cart, other people purchase it, yeah. they can no longer complete their purchase. Yeah, yeah I've seen you um, posted the other day, like, save your card details. Yeah. Like, do as much as you can to be, yeah. you know, you were very good at, I read the caption, and it was very good at, like, if I now want to buy from your drop, I know all the key things to hit to yeah. ensure that I have the best possible Which chance. I know, I, like, I understand that I've made this weird, I've made it, seem like a very frantic crazy thing but guess what? it is yeah. and, I, and i can't change that i can't suddenly make it you don't want not to popular it. yeah but uh, i can't make it easier for people yeah. unless i do a, unless i really limit the amount of people who go into the shop and buy things um but there are i have had some glitches there was a glitch a while ago where I, where an object that was only meant to be one of sold three times for some reason and it was the most expensive object on the website right. so i had to refund the people and let them know which right. they're fine about um okay. Generally, though, it's pretty good. I, I don't have many issues whatsoever, so that's good. I that's can't really complain. Good. Yeah, that's weird. Doesn't, that's add, weird. doesn't add to the stress. No. So we've kind of covered loads. We've got a few of the harder hitting ones now. Oh. Is this the true Florian Gadsby? Is this the final form? In terms of my work? In terms of you, all of this. Could you have ever seen yourself doing anything else? Is this what you see yourself doing right through to the end? What? Uh, I would like to be a potter until I die. Um, it's really interesting looking at the work I made 10 years ago and comparing it to what I make now. Mm. And I'm very intrigued by the notion of seeing what my work is like in 20 years or 30 years and comparing it back to what it is now. Yeah. And it's one reason why I keep making mugs because there are lots of potters who reach a certain point in their career where they tend to focus maybe on the more decorative, expensive work and they stock galleries in the work sells for, you know, 50, 100, 200 grand. Um, but they don't make mugs anymore. And I, I think it's kind of a shame because it would be interesting to see how they are... Because a mug is such a simple... Well, it can be, for me, it's such a simple object inherently, but 
despite mine being very simple, what they looked like five years ago to what they look like now is very different. Mm. So it would be interesting. I, I want to carry that on throughout my life. Yeah. But who knows? Uh, midlife crisis might happen. <laughs> I, uh, I was telling you that I like metal work. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'll start introducing more metal. I, I would love to do um, start making uh, beaten metal lids to fit in some of my pots or yeah, in- yes. introducing some yes, do it. other component. Um, my dad was a jeweler and part of his life. Now he um, does woodwork, but he, you know, he makes uh, wooden uh, spoons and decorative all kinds. Of, uh, you really have to. He's called Toft Monkey on Toft Monkey. Uh, Toft Monkey. Uh, have you ever done any collaboration between the both of you? Uh, we've shown in the same. We've done exhibitions together, but yeah. we've never. Um, it'd be nice to do like a father son thing. Yeah, that would be super cool. But he, you know, he he does the wooden work and then he beats metal and makes beautiful like rings and things and combines materials. And I think there's a lot to. Um, a lot to explore, potentially. Yeah, I think or, so. or I'm very interested in maybe you know glass lids for ceramic vessels. Okay. Just I think yeah, but then that's a whole other skill to learn, which I would love to do. But then you've got to have the time to be able to do that, and um, I guess be sort of comfortable financially if you are already running a business to stop doing that in order yes. to learn something else to then take it. Yeah. And when you look at the amount of time that's been invested into learning pottery, yeah, yeah. to then do something else to that standard so that it mm. matches the pottery is that's a mammoth task. But I do think, you know, crafts people if, if if you spent your life dedicated to learning a craft and training your eye, I do think skills are relatively transferable mm-hmm. yes. to some degree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um I taught a saddle maker how to weld in the morning. Oh really? Yep. Taught yeah. a saddle maker how to weld in the morning and picked it up like that. So because they had the hand motor skills, the eye skills they yeah. could understand. And you know that if you know what you want to create, um so yeah, I, I would look maybe long term. I would Flor and Gatsby will remain sort of the same. Yeah. Um, but maybe introduce more elements, and I would like my work to become more refined. Yeah. But who knows? Who know? You know, I've no idea what I can't. I could, there's no way to envision what it's going to be like in ten years. Yeah. And you seem quite comfortable with that. Mm-hmm. I'm fine that. with that. Yeah. Which I think is really. I think it's, it's the interesting natural evolution of a potter. You know, no potter keeps making the same work they've made their entire life. It yeah. does change. Yeah. Um, and that's really interesting. What about apprenticeships? You obviously done a lot of time in apprenticeships. You've done a bit of time teaching. You ever thought about taking an apprentice on? I would love. Well, so it's probably the most email. The email I get the most is oh, okay. um, apprentice or intern, to the point where it's maybe like fifteen Just have a whole to twenty. School. Well, well, yeah. So I get maybe 20, 15, 20 requests a week. Wow. Um, I would love to. Um, Poor little boy whining. He'll be okay. Um, He'll be fine. I would love to. Um, I think up. a lot of it comes... Is he allowed up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to have him I think, he's, I think he's trying to get up. <laughs> He's coming up. I can stick him on my... Well... No, no, don't be daft. Yay. Up, <laughs> get involved, eh? You get involved in the podcast too. Fall asleep with it. Oh, yeah. is that your... Oh, shit. Don't worry, I got it. You're not allowed on the table, though. I'm not allowed on the table here. Thank you. Sorry, yes. Um... I, this is the this is the reality of our podcast. It's there's just, dogs involved. Yeah, um, shop dogs. It's good though. He's wants um, some action. Yeah, yeah, apprenticeship. So you get fifteen to twenty emails a week. I would love to. The truth is, my work model at the moment, I don't think really would work with one. My my this space isn't very big. Mm-hmm. It would be quite an intimate, tight relationship, and I already don't really have enough space in here at the moment to do, put any new work. Mm. I think if I was to have an apprentice, I would want to have a space large enough that they could produce work and have kind of their own little yeah. station um, and, you know, even accommodation or something like that where they can just live and work and it, it'd be kind of a bit more straightforward. Um, but, you know, you're right. It's the way I was taught and I would very definitely like to teach to teach people in the same way. Um, but, in, yeah, I, I would also feel guilty because I film so much in here. Mm-hmm that I'd probably just be telling them to, to be quiet for most of the day. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like I stick my camera on and I'm filming portrait and landscape for all my platforms. And I feel like part of me would just be telling them to be quiet. And I do not want that to be the case. Yeah. I want it to be a, 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 a system where I can do my own thing and they can, I can teach them and they can come and see what I'm doing and we can work together. But we also have our own space, sort of space. So that's, I think the long, the long term goal, if it can ever be financially achieved, um, I should say that I'm also very open to having people here for short term, very short, you know. Yeah, cool. Um, 
I've had some people ask to come and like see how to fire the gas kiln. And I, I said, okay, come on this day. It's going to be a long, you know, long day. It's going to be loud. This kiln's loud, but I will teach you, you know, show you how I fire my gas kiln. I'm totally up for doing that. Wicked. Um, but yeah, I think long term, I would love to have a space where I can, you know, have my wood, uh, gas kiln, wood kiln, soda kiln, electric kiln, and then I would have my throwing room, and then I would have space for an apprentice or two. Nice. That would be my ideal, the ideal situation. Setup. I have no idea if that's ever going to happen, or whether you know, probably not feasible in London. But yeah. I think that'd be really fun because you know, Lisa's had something like fourteen apprentices, wow. but her work style kind of calls for it soda firing um you need to have two people spraying the soda into the kiln at the same time for her particular kiln anyway she actually requires more she needs but also it's it's really physical heavy kiln shelves um it's hard work and as you get older yeah maybe you do need someone to help you lift and move and do all that thing because pottery is very physical Mm -hmm. yeah and she produces work on a much you know quite a high scale big pots um it's a, it's a lot of work to do by yourself. So yeah. I think maybe there'll come a, a point in my life where it calls for it. But I would, I would hopefully get there sooner. Um, but we'll see. I think it'd be really fun. I think yeah, it'd be, be fun. I, I kind of dread the application process. Oh, yeah. I don't know, yeah. I don't know what I would do. Like aptitude test. It'd be like the X factor. Uh, yeah, X factor. <laughs> throw me a pot and send me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Do what you can. It's interesting you mentioned, and this is maybe where we can give back to you for how much time you've given us. You say shooting landscape and portrait for everything. If you shoot 4K landscape, that is the same as 1080p portrait. So you can frame it and cut yes. horizontal. My only issue, yeah. I've tried doing that, but then you've Storage. got to make sure everything's in the middle. <laughs> yeah. So you never get quite the right framing. So you can get, and I've looked at them for hours, Yeah. and it may not be the right solution, No. but um, you can get sticker overlays for your screen. Oh, I so see. that it frames it, and that's quite handy. Because I've got yes. on our premiere, I've got a, just like a PNG with just the lines for oh, cool. what the the horizontal and I vertical see. would be, and that works really well. Yeah, maybe I time hack. I, I, well, the other thing is it then means you have to shoot everything in four K, which well, is well, that's the other thing. I mean, but yeah, but part of me is thought like maybe I should just get two cameras and put them on a rig, you know, one like that, one like that, and I'm like, that's ridiculous, Florian. <laughs> I had a wee rig from going out to America with the wee DJI oh, sure, on my phone. Rig, yeah. Oh, really? So I was just holding like the DJI and the phone was attached to it. Yeah. So it was doing that and that. So it was quite good. That was really good. It was good. I mean, it's kind of, I just find it a bit, when first, uh, well, for the longest time I wasn't doing YouTube, so I didn't have to think about it. So yeah. everything was portrait. Um, but it's a bit ridiculous, isn't it? Having to film everything bloody what? two orientations. Like yeah. who's, who would have thought that? That was a thing we had to deal with. <laughs> yeah. The editing time for these things does take a long time. It's, yeah, it's it's crazy. It, it eats up. But like anything, you get faster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you're yeah. getting faster at editing. Yeah, much quicker. And it's just time under tension. It's just doing it. Yeah, exactly. So, a couple of last questions. Um, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? Fail. Um, What's up, best time? What's up? You ready? Yeah, I what would you do fail. if you knew you couldn't fail? As in, I could produce any work and I knew it would be successful? Anything. Open question. I would slow down my workflow. I would stop doing social media if I knew I would still be able to sell my work. Really? I would. I would focus on the work and I would just post seldom updates to keep the audience in- intrigued. I would um, start producing larger, more dramatic pieces. Not dramatic. The glazes I use basically, at the moment, if they don't go on in a very uniform layer, yeah. they look shocking. Right. Which makes glazing larger work very tricky. A lot of people, when they, they glaze larger pots, they pour the glaze around them. Mm. Okay. Um, and then you, you rotate the pot and you pour the glaze on and it goes on in, in a layer. The problem with this one is if you have an unevenness in texture, it can just look really not great. Yeah. So I do have a... a, a, a there's this... this point where I need to tackle it either I need to start spraying on glazes but spraying on glazes as thickly as I need them to go on Mm -hmm. would take hours um I'm presumably space to spray glazes space yeah everything so um if I knew I couldn't fail yeah I would slow down my social media output I would focus on making more beautiful standalone craft films and guides Mm. I would very 
I would happily give give up the daily churn of feeding the beast, the social media beast, mm. and I would um, make work to sell in more considered collections, maybe. But uh, truth be told, I might not change my life otherwise that much because I'm quite happy. Happy. That's Good. fantastic. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, there are challenges I would try and do. But you know, I, I'm I'm I am happy. That's wicked. Uh, that's fantastic. That's, that's the first time I've asked that question because it's a question that Kate came across earlier in the week. It's good. It that's going to be a hard, question. hard answer to beat. If I couldn't fail, I mean, or if, I don't know though. Would I just quit altogether and just go live in <laughs> countryside? I don't know. That, that, I don't know what entails. Know it entails too much. Wild. Yeah, <laughs> I'd fly. If I knew I could learn to fly, I'd, no, I would just oh, yeah. personally fly. I mean, but, if I can, if I can do anything, <laughs> oh, oh, bloody hell. <laughs> No, I'd, I'd mean in your craft, and I think that's a fantastic uh, answer. No, I'm I'm generally content, but I would I would slow down my life and 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 yeah. So you've said you want to build or make pots, and you want to be a potter till we die, like forever. Has the like the YouTube and all these other things? Does that allow you a retirement? Like a lot of a lot of makers, we're all living so much in the moment. I'm very well aware that we don't think about what's next. Yeah. Have you thought? Is that something you've gave much thought to in the sustainability of your business going forward? Doing more social, more videos, or I, I don't know what that looks like. Like, what what does a sustainable I mean, retirement or or is there a time for someone like you? Potters tend to either work until they die. Mm -hmm. they tend to not stop or they'll have a health issue that will cause them to stop being able to make it's very rare that they retire um i only know a few potters who've actually just retired and but they tend to be potters who've had a more production pottery led life right yeah. so they've made you know jugs and mugs and bowls for their whole life they throw thousands of pieces a week it takes the toll on their body but they retire like normal people but generally most potters i know who work you know studio potters mm. who build a whole style around uh, around them, a whole you know way of life. They tend to work until they go. Um, and uh, fine, you can come up here. Go on. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, not on the mic. Not on the mic. Not on the mic. Um, where was I going? Talking about studio potters retiring and traditional shop studio potters don't tend to retire. Yeah. God, why do I keep losing my train of thought today? What was the original? Point? It's warm today. Have you thought about <laughs> retirement and what that looks like as a maker? Oh yeah, I mean it's it's tricky because um, some potters. Um, if you think about it, right, as as a maker, you've got this 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 period of your life where your pots are going to be the best you're ever going to make them. Yeah. And then as you get older, there'll be a period where they get worse. Your ideas will still be great, but technically they'll get worse, or you might struggle to create the work you want to because you physically can't mm. and there are some potters who at that point question whether they should should give up because does you know does the world just need worse renditions of what you've been trying to create which i think is maybe a sad way to look at it mm -hmm. um i like to think that people would respect the pots no matter what and maybe they would become their own kind of thing um you know if you think of monet's uh paintings of the lilies he was painting them when he was going blind, right? But they were beautiful. I, 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 I like to think that potters continue doing the same thing. Would, would they would be beautiful in their own right? And because they've got this whole history and lineage behind them. Um. So, I don't know what retirement looks like. YouTube is is good in a way because it provides some sort of passive income. You yeah. know, you create the videos and it does it 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 kind of pays my rent and I don't have to think cool. about it because they just tick along. And I think. The good thing about my work, well, any sort of tutorial online for ceramics, for instance, it's a video that's going to live and perform for a long time because people are always going to be wanting to find tutorials on how to throw. So it's not it's not like you're putting something out into the world that's only going to last a couple of yeah. weeks. Yeah, it's timeless almost, isn't it? So yeah, like the, my videos that have been most successful, they've kept, they just plow on, right? Yeah. So it's quite a good thing to think about uh, building a body of videos online just to kind of sustain but I have no idea what retirement is going to look like yeah. I, I would like to make until I can't any longer um, I have no idea what that would look like uh, hopefully the pots are still good but it probably won't be got a funny feeling it might be <laughs> yeah. it just might be yeah. I, yeah, I, don't, I don't know that, uh, yeah um, 
there's a very lovely image about potters who are old and doing what they love you yeah. know, their whole life. I, I, I would like to be one of those people who's happy doing what they do. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I don't know what he wants. Oh, so, final Kate, your final question. Oh. Your wrap up. Because yeah. we've probably been on air over three hours now. No you've way. taken so much of your oh time. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, what advice would you give your younger self? Uh, how young? When do you think you needed it most? Yeah. Maybe my younger self, I would say, look after yourself more. I had quite an unhealthy um, teenage years where I was um, not the healthiest. I used to play a lot of video games and I don't think I maybe lived my teenage years to the extent I should have. Which I do sometimes regret um, looking like at my friends who lived... I lived in London, they lived in Hertfordshire and Kings Langley. And I used to watch a lot of them you know, live out their teenage years in a way I never did. Hmm. And I think maybe I would have liked that life to grow up in a, a, a more um, sociable way. Otherwise, I don't know. I mean, that's quite a deep one, isn't it? Um, it's always my final question. Yeah. Do what you love, but I do what I love. Right, so what, what do yeah. I say? Um, it can be a vice that you still live by. Yeah. yeah. I think looking at generally people I know doing what you love and being passionate about something is the most important thing because really what is the point in spending your life doing something you don't love I know not everyone is capable of doing that and it's maybe a lucky and privileged position to be in to do what you love for your entire life but um, yeah those are my two things I think nice Richard. mate I have thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed today yeah. oh thanks for having it's me been it's been really fun um, is it good I'm glad you've enjoyed it yeah it's, it's you know it's just been wicked like it's in in many ways it's everything i expected you be in some very key ways it's absolutely not what i expected yeah, you to be. yeah. well it's been nice having a day not spent making pots and <laughs> just chatting about things making like, pots <laughs> yeah well yeah or just things that you think about and you would never usually talk about talk yeah. about so yeah. that's the whole idea isn't it? so as a quick recap you're at florian gadsby floriangadsby.com yeah books out september -ish. september 14th um book tour uk book tour uh, September, late September, I don't know exactly. Should yeah. be doing something in Edinburgh in September 12th. Nice. But yeah, all the information will be available uh, on my website and on my Inst Instagram tends to be where I post uh, <laughs> <laughs> regular updates about things. So. And you've got the shop I've just dropped on Sunday yeah. before we've launched this. And you've also got the Yorkshire Sculpture Park as well. Yes, so Yorkshire Sculpture Park exhibition runs. That's your first independent one, isn't it? I've had a solo exhibition in Japan, but that was a very different right. experience. Right. Um, this will be my first, yeah, solo show here, um, and that's November fifth until February something. So it's quite a, a good it's chunk a big of time. Show. So, wow. Yeah, it's a good, ch good chunk of time. Um, but um, yeah, will you be there any of the nights for people to? You will surely be there. For why, opening. Yeah, for the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, I'll be there. There's going to be a few dates where I'm going to be throwing. There'll be some cool. book signing days, um, and yeah, this dog, he's he's <laughs> done. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and where do people find out about that? Uh, there's like links in my socials. Also, if you search uh, Florian Gadsby by my hands, Yorkshire Sculpture Park, there'll be plenty of information online. Um, Brilliant. Well, thanks again. Thanks Thank again. you. Really, really enjoyed yeah. it. Thanks for having Such us. Fun. It was so worth the journey down. It's <laughs> been wicked. I in the heat. To get it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait to get it out. I think it's not just for potters, but makers everywhere. There's a lot of good stuff to think about and a lot of stuff to take from it. You've done a fantastic job. Well, thank you. Thank it's you. been a pleasure. Thank Cheers, you. pal. See ya.